Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is a part two interview with Bernardo Castrip. If you haven't seen part one, it's right on my channel. It's the very last video I did. It's about Sean Carroll and illusionism. So if you want the context for this video, go ahead and check out part one. So for now, I'm just gonna jump right into the questions. So Bernardo, uh, Tim Modlin uh, made some interesting statements to you. Um, I wanna know, is he wrong? Uh, or are you overstating the case about the Nobel Prize uh, for 2022 and about uh, refuting local realism? Because some say that's a pillar of physicalism. So do you think maybe you overstated it or is he perhaps incorrect? What do you think? Well, there are certain things that are uh, clear and some that are contentious. What is clear, I think, at this point is that... Um, the quantum entanglement experiments that uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2022, uh, there are no plausible or even implausible loopholes uh, left. The first experiment um, to verify that, in other words, to verify that certain physical quantities or properties uh, cannot be said to exist prior to measurement. They arise out of measurement. That, uh, that's one of the ways to summarize the conclusions. Um, the first indication, experimental indication for that was in the late 70s. And then Alan Aspect and his collaborators did a series of experiments already closing some loopholes in the early 80s, 81, 82. And then we had four more decades of loopholes being progressively closed. Experiments done in Austria, in Switzerland, a number of places, uh, until the Big Bell collaboration test in 2018, I think it was. Uh, some experiments done in Delft here in the Netherlands, I think 2015. And so there are no loopholes. So th th this is a fact. Um, how you interpret the result is to some extent contentious. You can propose certain empirically uh, unsubstantiated uh, theoretical entities that allow you to account tentatively for those results without parting with physical realism. In other words, without parting with the notion that physical entities have properties prior and independent of measurement. Those theories uh, encompass at least two. One is the Everettian multi-world theory, which basically says that uh, every, exper every experimental outcome, every possible result of measurement actually does happen, but it happens in an inaccessible parallel universe where, where there is a copy of you running the same experiment and getting a different result. Now, this is a way to, to basically discount the meaning of any measurement because all other possible measurement outcomes also happen in, in an in a inaccessible parallel aberration uh, universe. So if a result of measurement contradicts your expectations, fret not, you can still stick to your favorite theoretical prejudices um, because the results that don't contradict your expectations also happen in some inaccessible parallel universe. So this, this is one class of theoretical account of these results that, don't, that, that doesn't part with physical realism. Another one is called now super determinism which is a hidden variables theory. It basically says there are some hidden variables. We don't know what they are. We haven't been able to define any hidden variables in any realistic way for this actual universe. All we have defined were fantasy hidden variables in a toy model, in a toy universe. So we don't know what they are. We don't know how they work, uh, but we propose that they do whatever needs to happen so we can stick to physical realism. In other words, it's, an, it's a vague, beyond vague, uh, attempt to, to have an excuse not to part with one's favorite metaphysical prejudices despite real experimental results contradicting 
those metaphysical prejudices. But there are people there in the community who take those two classes of alternatives uh, quite seriously. Sean Carroll is one of them. Uh, Zabine Hostenfelder is another one. But if you talk to, I, I don't want to name, name names here. Um, it, it wouldn't be appropriate. But uh, I've gotten messages of sympathy from a few people in the physics community after my attempt at debating uh, team modeling. Um, in general, the idea of these hidden global hidden variables that do some magic that we can't even theoretically define so we can dev device, devise an experiment to verify or falsify them, we don't even do that, so vague they are. Um, it, it is extremely optimistic. It would be so incredibly convenient for the universe to be, it, the universe would have to be deceiving us almost in a deliberate way. Um, it's something akin to, to the creationist saying, well, God simply planted the fossils uh, in the fossil record to deceive man. Yeah, okay, then God planted the <laughs> hidden variables to deceive physicists. That's Can a good I one. Yeah, I, I can't refute that completely for the same reason that I can't refute the flying spaghetti monster or, or a number of things that are implausible there. Uh, but I would question uh, the motivation for one to entertain that, given that there is an alternative that doesn't require any of those empirically inaccessible imaginary entities, such as imaginary uh, undefined hidden variables and inaccessible aberration multiverses, which is to say, well, the physical world is what arises from measurement. The thing that is measured is not itself physical. Uh, physicality is a representation of a measurement outcome done on this non-physical thing. Now, when I say non-physical, I don't mean spiritual uh, uh, or otherworldly. What I mean by non-physical are states out there in nature that are not describable in terms of physical quantities alone. And we know that these states exist. Uh, how many kilograms does my thought weigh? How many inches uh, uh, does my emotion measure? Uh, what's the length of my emotion? You know, you can't fully characterize or exhaustively characterize endogenous mental states with physical quantities. And in that sense, they are non-physical. So what I'm saying is that nature out there is constituted of such kinds of states, states that cannot be exhaustively characterizable through physical quantities. And what we do characterize through physical quantities is a representation of those external states that arises upon measurement, like the indications on a dashboard. Uh, uh, the physical world is, is a dashboard. It's, it's what is displayed on the dials of a dashboard that represent a measurement of external states. And if you don't measure anything, then the dashboard shows nothing. Does that mean that there is no real world out there? Of course not. There is still a sky, even if there are no airplanes flying around representing measurements on their dashboards. It only means that the real world isn't physical. In other words, it's not a dashboardish. Uh, it's, it's different kinds of states. And the physical quantities we invented, we invented to describe perception. And perception is uh, the dashboard, even the outcome of instruments, you know, the results that instruments measure, those results need to be perceived by human beings for them to, to be anything, for them to have any impact on our knowledge. So that, that's the argument. Uh, I know for a fact that, I, I, I can't say whether it's most of them, although I suspect that very strongly, um, many, many physicists uh, agree with me on this. Um, and there are some who don't, and they tend to be very vocal, and, and they are popular because their fantasies um, can be leveraged by the media in order to create economically very successful stories, like a Black Mirror with sentient uh, uh, silicon computers and, and whatever, the, the time travel and parallel, a variation parallel universes. I emphasize a because I'm not against all multiverses. Some multiverses, especially to do with the Big Bang and all that, th there is good theoretical reason to entertain the possibility. But multiverses based on all measurement outcomes actually happening in a parallel universe, I think this is just fantasy. It is nonsensical. And, and there is absolutely no uh, 
empirical suggestion for this, let alone evidence. The same applies for the hidden variables. They are not even theoretically defined in a way that would allow us to, to design a experiment that could falsify the hypothesis. So th th there is nothing behind it. It, it. As we say in the Netherlands, it's hot air. Um, it's um, there's just nothing there but but fantasy, uh, and many agree with this assessment. So no, I don't think I overstated the case. I think the culture needs to hear these things um, said. Otherwise, sci-fi will merge with ungrounded theoretical physics, as it already is, and it will educate our children or the young people in our culture to consider plausible things that are completely ungrounded fantasies. I don't think that is culturally healthy. So every now and then somebody has to come up and say, nonsense, nonsense. There is nothing behind this. It's just fantasy aimed at rescuing one's metaphysical preferences and prejudices from the clutches of experimental results. That's all there is to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Before I get to Kyle's question, it just reminds me of like, so imagine you're playing the game Clue. You've narrowed it down to one suspect, but uh, Tim Maldon's over here like, no, there's a hidden suspect. I swear he's <laughs> he's not on the board or nothing. You can't see, but it's there. I swear. <laughs> so, uh, so Kyle, I'll go ahead and uh, pass it on to you there. All right. So we are on to a quick follow-up from Michael Levin's work. Um, yeah, I just want to apologize, Bernardo. You're, you're right. Uh, so Michael Levin actually, with the new Adventures in Awareness video coming out, he does believe that the fundamental reality is is mental. Um, so that's that's awesome. But he does something that's different, and it does seem to have a bit of a, a different view to analytic idealism in the sense that he has combination. So he might have a fundamental mental world, but instead of the combination, it's bottoms up. Um, so, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> no? Okay, so this is one of the things that he does. He says that uh, in, the, in the Xenobots one, he says that they're more likely to have than not to have an emergent awareness of the two prior subjects combining into one system. Um, I know you said it maybe might be an aggregate where they kind of work together. No, even if there is, even if they form only one consciousness. Okay, I, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, here's the subtlety. Let's take analytic idealism. There is only one field of subjectivity, only one mind. And it can dissociate and become seemingly many. If it can dissociate, then it can reassociate. The analytic idealist, the moment the analytic idealist grants dissociation, they also grant reassociation because it's just the reverse process. If it can go away one way, it go it can go back the other way, especially because going back is the original state. When we die, we reassociate. Um, so, I, the way I interpret Michael's words, I mean, again, you have to ask him. I, I am very careful about not speaking for him. Um, but the way let's put it, the way I interpret his words is that um, everything is just one mind. Everything is just one field of subjectivity, and it can dissociate. But if it can dissociate, then we can artificially induce a reassociation because going back is the original state. The moment you grant that one subjectivity can seemingly become many, you grant that you can reverse that process. So Michael's xenobots, they are dissociated, like cancer is a dissociation. Um, but if it can dissociate, then we can artificially induce a return to a state closer to the original one, which is the fully associated state. So that, that is not combination. Combination is when you start primarily and fundamentally from different fields of subjectivity, and you say that they somehow merge. This is incoherent, and there are, there, there, there's a long argument for why this is incoherent. In any case, it's empirically unsubstantiated. But if everything is already happening in one field of subjectivity, fundamentally, to begin with, and dissociation is a kind of cognitive illusion, then reassociation is just undoing that illusion. And we should be able to induce it artificially for the same reason that 
one day we will be able to induce the dissociation artificially. In other words, create a life from non-life or, or abiogenesis. And, and Michael's work is about this. Uh, it, for instance, uh, I, I don't know whether this is published now, but I, I, I hope he doesn't get mad with me if this is not published and he didn't want to talk about it yet, but I'll be vague about it. Um, he Sorry, Both his papers are published now. Yeah, but there is one about cancer in frogs. I don't know whether there that one's already... one, but I'm not okay. So I'll, I'll be vague about it. He either he has shown or he will show publicly uh, at some point soon that um, you can induce cancer. In other words, you can induce dissociation in in an in an amphibian amphibian. And you can once that's done, and it's done through genetic mutations. So no hard penetrant genetic mutations that create a malignant tumor. Despite all of those genetic mutations, you can operate with the, the biofields around the thing in such a way that the cancer stops and goes into full remission and just disappears, even though the genetic mutations are still there. That is an, a way to force a reassociation because the frog didn't have cancer to begin with. You know what I mean? So you so you're forcing a reassociation. So this is all entirely consistent with analytic idealism. If you start from one fundamental field of subjectivity, then you can dissociate and reassociate. If you grant one, you have to grant the other. And analytic idealism grants one, so it must grant the other. So that's one way to interpret what Michael is saying. But to know for sure, you have to ask him. I completely agree. That's fair. But I there's also one that I have from uh, people who think combination is a real thing. And they said, well, how do you deny sperm and egg? Those are definitely two things coming together, forming a new one. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's already an instance of uh, 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 reassociation in nature. Uh, again, for the mm -hmm. analytic idealism, the only way that reassociation can happen is because they were in the same field of subjectivity to begin with. And that is very different from the combination problem in constitutive panpsychism. Because in constitutive panpsychism, you start by saying the sperm and the egg are fundamentally separate fields of subjectivity. And then you run into the combination problem when you're trying to argue that they become one. Uh, but under analytic idealism, you don't have the combination problem because we are not talking about separate fields of subjectivity anyway we are talking about associative or dissociative cognition in what is fundamentally, from the beginning, one field of subjectivity. So this is the sperm and the egg is not a combination in the constitutive panpsychist sense. The sperm and the egg, in the analytic idealist sense, is a reassociation. Oh, I see. Oh, did you have more to add to that, Kyle? Go ahead. Um... No, because the, the other question was about networks of cells com uh, communicating to form an emergent subject, but it's this, it, 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 you could say yes, but it would be submergent um, because it's a, a, a Correct. Re association. So Correct, but, but I don't think this is what's happening in the case of uh, uh, multicellular organisms that haven't been engineered in the laboratory like Michael is doing. For instance, we, I don't think we are cells that reassociated. I don't think the dissociation ever happened because we begin as a unicellular zygote in the womb of our mother. Um, and then that one cell creates internal structure in a fractal way. And the only thing it knows to be is a cell. So to create internal structure, it, it iterates on that template, the only one it knows how to be. And we call it mitosis or cell division. And, and that cell division goes on and on and on until we have this multicellular organism that we call a human being. But I don't think these cells are parts, proper parts of a human being. I think they are just the internal fractal structure of a unitary entity. The same entity we were when we were that zygote, unicellular zygote in the womb, in the womb of our mother. We are still that unitary entity, but with more internal structure because there are evolutionary advantages for this internal structure. Uh, we would be reassociated if the way we came into the world was by 
a few trillion cells crawling and piling up on top of one another until they form the human being. Well, that's not what happened. What happened is that we were one cell, and now we speak of many cells as if they were proper parts, but they aren't. They are just the internal structure of that single entity, the zygote that we were from day one. That, that's the idea. Yes, this is, I'm so glad you said that. I've talked about this before with other people, mainly in private, about the priority of the whole. People start with the parts they want to build up, but you're absolutely right. You start off as one, and then you diversify into many there. So before I go up down that rabbit hole, I'll get to my next question. So the next one is about psychedelics. Some LSD and psilocybin studies are publishing as of late that they're now finding an increase in brain stimuli that is otherwise, you could say, filtered out when sober. More areas of the brain are communicating with each other in subtle ways. And so there's this increased connectivity is uh, perhaps maybe one of the reasons, but not brain noise. So a materialist would say something like, maybe that it's the default mode network shutting down during a high dose of psychedelics. And they say that might confirm materialism because those areas, if online, would not be present, which is the case. So uh, what would you say? The argument, the physicalist argument is that um, you have strong inhibitory processes associated with the default mode network. And they filter things out by inhibiting other neuronal processes elsewhere in the brain uh, in order to maintain our attention, to maintain our focus on survival relevant uh, tasks and a healthy sense of identity that is also survival relevant. If you don't know who you are, you don't take care of your own survival. For this to be true, the mechanism would have to be the following. Psychedelics would impair or inhibit the inhibitory processes. So in the place in the brain where those inhibitory processes were active, the brain would become more inactive. And that would be the default mode network. But then because the bouncers, the inhibitory processes, are now partly off the table, some other neuronal processes elsewhere, not in the default mode network, um, would have to increase because they are now disinhibited. The inhibitor has itself been impaired, so other processes are disinhibited, and you would expect then um, the activity associated with these other uh, neuronal networks to increase because they are disinhibited. Um, for over 10 years, which was the time I followed uh, the literature until I thought this has now been confirmed so many times, you know, I, I, I don't need to follow this anymore. Up to that point, uh, there were no increases uh, seen anywhere in the brain. You would only see decreases. And then the argument that uh, you decreased the inhibitor, so something else has been disinhibited, doesn't hold because where is that disinhibition disinhibition where is that i should see an increase somewhere else in the brain but there are no there were no increases measured until for as long as i follow the literature uh, beyond measurement error that the the papers themselves uh, sort of explain away as measurement error uh, so that doesn't hold now um um functional connectivity um is the idea that um, even though activity, metabolism, is reduced with psychedelics, uh, whatever activity is left seems to be more coupled across uh, different brain regions. So you have more functional connectivity. Um, this has been put forward as a hypothesis, but uh, uh, a less emphasized hypothesis than the so-called uh, entropic brain hypothesis, which was pushed very hard by the Imperial College of London. Um, we don't need to talk about that because I think, at least I talked a lot about that. If you want, to, if you guys want, I can explain again why I think that is nonsensical. Uh, it is absolutely nonsensical. Um, but with publications showing that it's nonsensical, it seems that the focus is going back to functional connectivity. Now. One of the main papers that showed an increase in functional co connectivity it is very tricky. It's a paper that Michael Pollan um, uh, highlighted in his book, uh, Changing Your Mind, something like this. Um, it, it shows that under psychedelics, it, they, they show this graph 
um, um, with the, um, the vertices indicating different brain regions and the edges connecting the vertices representing uh, functional connectivity or, or correlations between activities in different brain regions. And they show that with psychedelics, you see more of these edges, more of these connections. But if you read the paper, you see that they are reducing the threshold for drawing an, an edge in that graph. Uh, so the fact that you see more edges doesn't mean what it seems to mean because it's not made with the same thresholds. You know, The threshold is reduced until they draw enough edges, whatever enough is in this case. And, uh, and they do say in the technical paper that the graphs are cartoons and should not be overinterpreted. But you see no such disclaimer in the book by Michael Pollan. And you don't see any of these disclaimers in all the popular communication that's made. And I think that is tragic. Look, theoretically, the way to go about it would be to use uh, integrated information theory. Integrated information theory uh, would tell you that um, it, it is not about raw activity. It is about uh, integrated information how much integrated information is present in a certain brain complex or in a certain neuronal complex. And um, with more functional connectivity, an argument can be made that you will integrate more information. It, it, it's an in-principle argument um, because in IIT or integrated information theory, it's all about the counterfactuals. Uh, for you to be able to say there is more information, you need to define your counterfactuals. And it's very tricky in IIT to define your counterfactuals. Depending on how you define it, uh, the amount of integrated information can vary widely, orders of magnitude. And it's not always clear what the definition is the correct one. So even doing what I'm proposing now would be tricky, but it's not what's being done either. Uh, the fact that there is questionable higher functional connectivity in residual brain activity does not account for the phenomenological explosion of a psychedelic trip. It, it, it under physicalism to say that the most the richest and most intense experience of one's life can be accounted for with a lot less brain activity, no increase in brain activity anywhere in the brain and some vague small levels of more functional connectivity is really forcing the issue. It, 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 you need a lot of faith, a lot of faith to think that that's plausible. Um, but uh, I, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I, I'll, I'll leave it there. As for the latest papers on psychedelics, maybe increasing activity somewhere in the brain, um, I haven't followed the liter literature for the past couple of years. I followed it for over 10 years, and it was consistent during all that time. Uh, I don't know what is being said right now. What I, what I do know is the following. I know that for a fact, um, from talking to people, there are a lot of neuroscientists out there who are physicalists, and they simply cannot accept that psychedelics really just reduce brain activity. Um, their metaphysical prejudice is, is so strong that for them it is inconceivable that can be the case, which in a sense strengthens my argument because my argument is precisely that such an observation is not consistent with physicalism. So there are two ways you can go about it. You can say it is consistent with physicalism or you can say the observations are wrong. It is inconsistent, but the observations are wrong. And there are neuroscientists following this latter path. They acknowledge my point. Yes, it is inconsistent. But for them, it means, therefore, the observations have to be wrong. And we have to do more experiments uh, to show that they are wrong. I mean, there have been so many experiments done in, in Switzerland, in the US, in the UK, in Brazil, showing the same reductions in brain activity that if an experiment comes up now saying, well, no, it, it actually increases. My tendency would be then to throw my arms up and start ignoring the neuroscience of psychedelics. Because look, what can you believe then? You, know, you, you say one thing for, I don't know, 12, 15 years, and, and, and then you start saying the opposite. It's like I throw my arms up and I stop reading. Because you know, 
what can I trust? What, what will happen 10 years from now? What will they say 10 years from now? You know, if, 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 if that is how the neuroscience of the psychedelic state is being done, then you might as well throw it away. Oh, yeah, no, there's a, there's a hidden brain variable process somehow, right? <laughs> That's what they want to say. <laughs> <laughs> this is what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny you said that because that's actually one of the things in the article. They said, well, the default mode network shuts down. My sense of self goes. Other processes go. Well, it seems like it's the brain shutting down when they're absent, but the brainstem is still going. So we must, it must be something in there and it's, there's a feedback loop cut off and that's why it's so mysterious. But you've already kind of answered why that doesn't make any yep. sense. So. Well, the information that would come from the brainstem is um, is uh, um, sensorial information. Um, it's not cognitive information. It's not episodic memories. It's not insights. It's not understandings. Uh, it's not um, modeling. Uh, and But the psychedelic trip, I mean, if people tried only a very, very small dose, then it's all sensorial. But the real psychedelic trip is anything but sensorial. It's about, people describe it as higher dimensional spaces, different kinds of logic, uh, profound insights into the nature of things. This is not the stuff that happens uh, coming through the brainstem. If you really want to ground it in brain processes, this is neocortex uh, stuff. It's... it's, it's uh, it's cognitive stuff. It's not sensorial stuff. Uh, so, yeah, that, that doesn't add up either. But you see, people will try to throw any half-baked uh, uh, promissory physicalist uh, theory uh, to escape um, the obvious implication of the experiments. This is happening not only in the neuroscience of consciousness, it's happening in foundations of physics. This is the equivalent in neuroscience of consciousness of aberration multiverses and superdeterminism. Exactly. And they'll make it unfalsifiable. They'll say, well, it's early in the process of neuroscience and we'll find a deeper layer somewhere beyond there. But then you just said it just contradicts all the other stuff. Yeah. And, and in a sense, you know, I... I have to be so careful because, but 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 I'm I'm too honest not to do that. I am a fan of integrated information theory, and I have come out publicly saying this. I, I've been that since 2017, but only last year I came out publicly saying that. But in saying this, I'm opening a very tricky door, because if you are not really honest when you apply IIT. IIT has this backdoor, very dangerous backdoor called the counterfactuals. It, counterfactuals go into the TPM, in, which in IIT define the amount of information we are talking about. In other words, what is not the case, but could be the case, determines the amount of information. But since it's not, since it is what is not the case, what is not the case cannot be measured. It is an inference. It could be the case. So by adding more and more of these inferences of what could be the case, you are immune from experimentation because since these are the things that could be the case but, but aren't, you can't measure them. So by, only, by, by keeping on adding these things that cannot be measured and verified, you can inflate the amount of information entailed by the TPM a lot under IIT. In other words, you can conclude anything you want if you are dishonest or if you are prejudiced. And, and, and that is a fantastic danger, an enormous mine in the field of IIT. Now, the people who are serious and are doing IIT, they are fully aware of that and they are exquisitely careful with this. They really want to avoid stepping on that mine themselves because they are honest scientists, and because counterfactuals, uh, counterfactuals are intrinsic to IIT, you cannot get rid of them. And you shouldn't get rid of them because it, the idea is valid. It's just how you go about applying it that is so tricky and, and so vulnerable to prejudice and, and, and dishonesty. So, so by endorsing IIT, I'm sort of opening the door for that, but um, yeah. 
It's the price of honesty. <laughs> Do you have anything to follow up with that, Emily, or we could just oh. oh no, good. Yeah, I'm. Is there anything else you want to go into? I think you have something about uh near death experiences. Is that right? Or yeah. Um. So there's an indie in uh, in a cell hypothesis. I'll have to unpack it just a little bit. But um. So Sam Parnia. Uh. So based on the most recent indie study, seems to be holding that we are in some sort of halfway state in the early hours of death. Um, so cells can be harvested and grown into stem cells weeks later, um, so that the part of us, so that part of us is not dead per se. Um, so I'm wondering if this is a problem for idealism or for the after death state, which is, um, with like dissociation under analytic idealism, as we would somehow be, uh, I guess you, you already talked about, uh, reassociation, disassociation, but it, it seems the way they were talking about it, it's an emergent based on cells functioning who we are. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah I'm just wondering if that's a problem with the cells being uh, so harvestable, et cetera. So. It, it's certainly not a problem for analytic idealism. You could construe it as a problem for the credibility of ND accounts, but I don't think it's a problem for that either. And I don't think Sam thinks it's a problem either. If you look at his latest documentary, which is what you're referring to, came out a few days ago, um, uh, it's a strange documentary because it has two halves. In the first half, the entire talk is about uh, brain cells going into a kind of, um, how do they refer to it? To a kind of hibernation. Exactly. Um, and they can be revived in a Petri dish even many hours after uh, um, the heart stopped uh, beating and since they stopped being infused with oxygen. Um, and then in the second half, it's about NDE experiences. And only towards the end of the documentary, uh, um, Sam tries to bring the two together, but it, it, it's a very forced way to bring them together. He says, well, the brain might not be dead, and there are experiences uh, after that. But it, it feels like two completely different documentaries, one about you know, the physiology of neurons and the other one about the phenomenology of the near-death experience, which he, he now calls recall, re recalled uh, recall experience the, of death. REDs, yeah, REDs. Yeah, REDs, yeah. Um, now, okay, so what does it mean for analytic idealism? Uh, nothing. It, if it does anything, it only helps. Because under analytic idealism, uh, biology the body, is what a dissociative process looks like. And death is the end of that dissociation. But the body, so, so, so it, the end of the dissociation then should correlate with the end of the body. But the body is still there. So one criticism that some people make of analytic idealism is precisely this. If the body is the image of the dissociation, then how come the body stays behind after the dissociation ends? And what these results are saying is the dissociation doesn't end like this auto instantly from one moment to the other. It is a process that will end with the end of the body, decomposition, loss of structural and dynamical integrity, um, but it's not instantaneous. So this helps analytic idealism. Because since the body stays behind and doesn't disappear instantly, if we now can show that, well, neither does the dissociation disappear instantly. Oh, fantastic. It's right. Um, there is an immediate difference when your heart stops beating, your metabolism comes to an end within seconds. What doesn't come to an end is the ability of cells to hibernate. Um, but that is then completely consistent with analytic idealism. The, in, the image remains for a while. Uh, um, it's not an instant end. Death is not an instant flip of a switch. Death is a process that takes a while and the body changes throughout that process. Metabolism ends very quickly, but the cells remain viable for hours. And if you wait for days, there is decomposition, de loss of structural integrity. So there is no flip of a switch, either in the dissociation or in the image of the dissociation, which only helps analytic idealism. Now, what does it say about NDEs? Does it make NDEs accountable under materialist premises? Absolutely not, because a state of hibernation is not an active state. 
to have a mind-boggling near-death experience, um, like what Ibn Alexander describes, um, we, and, and I think he's telling the truth. Uh, really. he, his, his narrative has the hallmarks of truth. And I'm not going to share what I think those hallmarks are. Otherwise, tomorrow there will be 25 NDs in my mailbox fulfilling all of those uh, hallmarks. But uh, it, uh, it it has the hallmarks of truth. These are spectacular, experience, spectacular experiences entailing profound insight uh, and imagery. Um, you cannot, under physicalist premises, account for that with hibernating brain cells. Uh, otherwise, you might have to start asking yourself as a physicalist, what do we bloody need an active brain for? If you can have spectacular cognition, multi-dimensional perception, insights, uh, lifetimes of memories, if you can have all that with hibernating, non-firing neurons, what the hell do we need firing neurons for? If you can have all that with a few viable neurons, why do we need 100 billion neurons in our cortex? Um, well, well, I forgot the numbers. Uh, it, see, we, we are born essentially premature as humans. And the reason for that is if we would grow more in the womb, our heads are so big compared to the rest of our bodies, that we wouldn't pass through the birth canal. Our mothers would die. They still die. There's a percentage of women that still die every year, despite medical technology, in childbirth, because humans are born with a fantastically big head. And why do we need that? Well, for the neurons. But if you can have an NDE with a handful of viable hibernating neurons, why would evolution give us the bloody head the size it is now? So physicalists have to be careful because in trying to account for everything in terms of a few viable neurons deep in the brain stem and hibernating without blood flow, without heartbeat, then they have to explain why do we need a heart? Why do we need a head this big? Why ordinarily experience is correlated with neuronal firings, not with hibernating neurons? So I don't think this understanding that death is not the flip of a switch, but a, 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 um, a progressive process that can last hours, maybe days. Uh, I don't think it helps a physicalist account of the NDE at all, not the least. And, and I think Parnia doesn't think that either. Otherwise, he wouldn't have put the second half of, of his documentary focused on um, uh, the reports, the accounts of NDEs by, by many doctors. Yeah, he, he he's also a bit hard to pin down sometimes, but I think he's been a very honest, open um, uh, doctor and scientist, etc. So um, he already answered this previously, too, but a couple of people online were getting together and thinking about this with IIT. Um, so they're wondering if we speculate about the above findings, right? So hibernation of cells with IIT, where the cells integrate information and are... Um, they said compounding up to an emergent subject with us. Um, they said, wouldn't analytic idealism be false? But you already said no. Um, and then they said, well, that communication between cellular networks is consciousness. I could also yeah. say the involuntary wiggling of my left big toe is consciousness. Uh, yeah. uh, this is a definition that doesn't honor the meaning of the word consciousness uh, uh, has in, in everyday dialogue. In other words, you can define the word consciousness in any way you want, but you're not going to sort out or solve the problem of consciousness by redefining the words to mean something that none of us actually means when we use the word. You know I, mean? uh, I have a friend, Menas Kafatos, he, he calls that the Pinocchio argument of consciousness. No, consciousness is uh, is Pinocchio's nose. When the nose grows, consciousness grows. I mean, it, 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 what kind of argument is that? It's argument by word redefinition. I mean, it doesn't mean anything. You can say it. It it, it complies with English grammar and syntax, but <laughs> you're not contributing.
contributing anything to the dialogue by saying consciousness is neurocommunication because you're not tackling the issue in, uh, on, uh, in front of us, which is how does the parameters of neurocommunication give rise to the qualities of experience? You, 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 you're not answering that question by just arbitrarily saying consciousness is neurocommunication. No, I say that consciousness is the wiggling of my left big toe. I know, what will you say? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, the other ones are just speculative too. They said, well, the problem is that uh, aren't the cells made of mind stuff too, right? Or it's in consciousness or made of consciousness. So that gets rid of that. But uh, the other ones, maybe this mind stuff becomes less and less as we go down the scale until it sucks off. And then there's there's no network and there's no consciousness. And But no, we, we, we kind of already answered that one. As well. Under analytic idealism, the fact that uh, after heart uh, heartbeat stops and the brain is no more perfused with oxygen and the cells go, go into that um, hibernation mode that um, the science of death now uh, has, has discovered, what that means is that under analytic idealism is that um, under analytic idealism, brain and brain activity are what our dissociated inner life looks like. But our dissociated inner life has two components, two discernible components. One is the mental process that enforces the dissociation, enforces the dissociative boundary. And the other one are the contents of the dissociation, the inner cognition within the dissociative boundary. Both should have an image. In other words, there should be patterns of brain activity that correlate with dissociation enforcement and other patterns of brain activity that correlate with the cognitive contents of the dissociation. Um, when heartbeat stops, uh, it stands to reason that the processes that enforce the dissociation stop. Um, and when the, when the brain cells go into hibernation, they are no longer enforcing the dissociation. And if you don't enforce a dissociation, then you can experience things that would otherwise be filtered out by the dis dissociation. That's the NDE. And the fact that you can, after that, remember the NDE means that um, the dissociation was not completely gone. Otherwise, you wouldn't have remembered anything. So the dissociation was vastly reduced, but not completely gone. If your heart would stop and you would immediately be burned to, to ashes, um, I don't think your subject in that other state of consciousness, consciousness afterwards would be able to report to, to itself the NDE in the way humans report, because that's conditioned on the dissociation still being viable and it's not viable afterwards. So if anything, the, the, this whole documentary sort of plays right into the hands of analytic idealism. Hibernating cells don't enforce the dissociation. So you experience more, you have the NDE, uh, which doesn't correlate with brain function. Uh, but there is enough still present in that hibernating state to allow you to remember the NDE afterwards and to have a cognitive pathway to access those memories afterwards. Um, these are problems you, we could have as analytic idealists if death really were instantaneous. Then an, an analytic idealist would have a bit of a problem. Like, well, if, if dissociation ends instantaneously, how come the body is still there? Well, now we know it's not instantaneous. That's why the body is still there. It's hibernating. And we wouldn't be able to explain self-awareness uh, self or the metacognitive recall of the ND because that is still conditioned on certain aspects of the dissociation. So the dissociation is largely gone, but cannot be entirely gone if you are to remember the ND. Hey, lo and behold, that's exactly what we now know. So I, I consider the whole thing great news. <laughs> Yeah, I have an anecdotal, uh, I guess this guy, it was circling around the internet on a couple of chats, and this guy was trying to explain his experience. Uh, I'm not sure how credible it is, but I have I have seen it, I read it, but basically it's someone online um, that a man claimed to have, uh, he was under an experiment where he was monitored as he died, and that after about 45 minutes or so, as the oxygen was burning off in the cells, everything got darker and scarier and frantic as his body was trying to survive. And he's like, that's what it is. It's just dying down until it goes all black. And, um, but that, but that still could be 
under analytic idealism too. Um, it doesn't mm. have to be pleasant. But I think he's trying to say about, well, this is just as a process slows down over time and that might lend credence to the cell hypothesis, but I don't know. I don't... This, this happens under psychedelics as well. Mm. You can be absolutely sure that you're dying because the, the entire narrative of the personal self, which is rich, consists of a lot of episodic memories, character, traces, dispositions, um, emotions. Uh, all of that is the inner narrative of the personal self, and psychedelics are acid against that. Um, if, when they kick in at high doses, you just dissolve that. And that experience of ego death, which many people experience as the certainty that you are dying, even though you know psychedelics are safe, when you're undergoing ego death, you can be sure that in that one case, they are going to kill you because it feels like a death. It empties out the part of your cognition that is under the microscope of meta-consciousness. And to be able to tell yourself what's happening to you, you need to be meta-conscious of what's happening to you. In other words, you not only need to experience what's happening to you, you need to know that you are experiencing it. If you are experiencing it, but you don't know that you are experiencing it, then you don't tell yourself that you are experiencing it. And everything happens as if you were not experiencing it. Now, psychedelics take a hammer to metacognition. And we can, as a psychedelic, kick in, and I know that from experience, um, what is under the microscope of metacognition becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. It, it, it starts becoming very tenue. Um, and, and you metaconsciously associate that with death. Whatever remains still in metacognition, you hold on to that so strongly. You put all of your attention on that because you think that this is the way not to die. It is to hold on to that less, last reminiscence of metaconsciousness still left in you. That attention to that one thing that is left obfuscates everything else because that's what metacognition does. That's what attention does. If you pay attention to one thing, everything else fades away. Sometimes I'm reading or thinking and my partner's talking to me, and I don't hear her talk to me. She, she has to go in front of me and wave her hand, hey, I'm talking to you. That's what metacognition does, metaconsciousness does. And so in psychedelics, you think at first, when you are undergoing ego death, that the drug is killing your experiences. But once you go through that transition, and metacognition is gone, the narrative of the personal self is gone. Then the obfuscation ends. And only then you realize how much experience is going on still. It is a ridiculous amount of experience. And when you are experiencing them, you're not telling yourself, I am experiencing this. You only tell yourself that um, when you recall the psychedelic trance after you come back and you're metacognizant again. Uh, I think under NDEs, and then psychedelics reduce brain activity, reduce uh, the activity in the in the default mode network. So does uh, um, um, cardiac arrest. <laughs> it reduces activity everywhere. So it stands to reason that some people will experience the first phase of the NDE as actual dying. Just like under psychedelics, we experience death, ego death. And it's only when you break through and the obfuscation ends it's like somebody with a torch light lit up one meter from your eyes as you're looking up to the sky at night. You only see that light. It's only one light. It's nothing. And then when that light starts dimming, but you're still used to the bright light, you think, oh, the light's going away. I'm seeing less and less and less and less until the light goes off and your eyes adapt. And then you see there are millions, billions of light out there. There is a whole galaxy, a whole cosmos out there right in front of your eyes. But if you don't go through the entire process and you stop before the torch lit up in front of your eyes completely uh, off, you think it's a dying process. You think it's a process of loss, less richness. And you only realize that it's the opposite when you complete it. If you don't complete it, you come back saying, well, it, it's just less. Maybe that's what's happening. 
we already answered the last two questions uh, prior. Uh, they said, well, the physicalist would just say, with all you said, <clears throat> all this is happening is the brain shuts down or it starts back up. And there was this period where infinitesimally amount of stuff happened in a fraction of a femtosecond. Um, I can just see you smiling. <laughs> but well, well, no, I, I don't dismiss this. I, I think okay. some NDEs may be that because look, before we were talking about neurons um, going to some kind of hibernation, yeah. but we know that uh, several seconds after brain activity seems to subside after death, well, after cardiac arrest, um, a minute or two afterwards, um, there is a, a, a momentary surge in brain activity again. It's like the last, uh, the last hooray of, uh, of your neurons. Sometimes it's a little longer too, sorry, but like five minutes. But yeah. yeah. So there is a sort of a metabolic rebound with whatever reserve, energy reserves are there. There is a last hooray. I think some experiences may be accounted for in terms of that, but I don't think you can account for all NDEs in terms of that. Otherwise, we could experience our whole lives in, 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 in one hooray. I mean... And that's not what happens. Uh, brain activity in time seems to correlate with experience in time. So there is no reason to think that that momentary uh, metabolic uh, rebound uh, a few minutes after cardiac arrest would correlate with more than an equally momentary experience, intense as it may be. It definitely wouldn't correlate with a long, timeless journey through other cognitive spaces, which is what most end the years seem to report. I think that is, again, um, forcing the issue way too much to defend physicalism. You, you, you see, what physicalism has going, the physicalism, physicalism has many things going for it. One of the big ones is the fact that um, it is so vague. Physicalists don't tell us how exactly brain activity leads to experience. If they were to tell exactly how the process works, we would, we would be able to judge this. Is that momentary metabolic rebound in the brain sufficient to account for the phenomenology of most NDEs? We would be able to judge that. But because physicalism does no such thing, it does not tell you how brain activity leads to experience, it, it, it leaves all the doors open. So now as a physicalist, precisely because physicalism is so vague and so explanatorily weak for being so vague, precisely because of that, a physicalist can always say, if there is any neuron anywhere in the brain at any time doing anything, then I can account for all experiences. Yeah, you see, that, 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 that's amazingly enough that is the cultural strength of physicalism because it doesn't explain any one thing, it can be claimed to explain everything. Well, that was the last one. It's it's the argument of ignorance, and we talked about that. Uh, it's like we simply don't have the technology to dig deep into deep brain areas that are unknown to us. Neuroscience is still early. I mean, that part, yeah, it is early. Um, but and that the brainstem is somehow active. It must be. But you know, you have. Bim von Malmo, and he's talking about uh, the the brain stem during these processes are, is completely absent. He, you shine the light in the eye, and there's no contraction. Gag reflexes are gone, and these are all heavy markers of um, of uh, the brain stem being completely off. Yeah. Um, Bim has the, seen enough, and he lives accordingly. Yeah, <laughs> Bim doesn't just doesn't just write papers; he lives accordingly. I know him personally, so. Okay, you know, oh, was there anything you were going to say right there, Kyle? No, it was just, I didn't know where else to ask this question, but somebody and a couple people wondering um, with that information, um, why do you see through these eyes? Are you the, are you, because I mean, oh, yeah. obviously the eyes connect to the brain, but are you the brain? Are you the body? Are you the system? Are you you are the experiential consciousness, but in a in a useful kind of everyday sense, what would you say you are then? Well, I, I'm not sure I will answer precisely this question, but what yeah. you said, how, how in an NDE, how, how can you see if your if your eyes are not working, even if your eyelids are closed, right? That that that's a big thing. Um, 
I had originally thought I I forgot we had this interview. I remembered after I woke up because I have my calendar that beeps with all the commitments of the day. Um, but uh, yesterday night, I thought I'm going to write an essay today, which I will still write to, later tonight or tomorrow. Uh, and it's uh, precisely about this, precisely motivated by that Samparnia documentary that just came out. Um, and, uh, I'll share my thoughts with you now before I wrote uh, the essay. Um, I do not think that we can see without eyes. It would it would raise lots of evolutionary questions. Why did we have to go through so much crap over 4 billion years to evolve these things called eyes if you can see everything without any eyes, if you can hear everything without any ears, right? How is, why? And, and, and I agree with this. I think evolution is not superfluous. It's not going through all this trouble to equip us with the sensory organs uh, if our so-called spirit, our minds, can see and perceive everything without sensory organs, this doesn't add up. And I let let me be let me bite this bullet. I believe in NDE reports, but I do not believe that NDE ears are actually seeing or hearing anything when their brains are not working, when they don't ha have a heartbeat, when their eyes are shut. So what is it that they are experiencing? N now bear with me, this will take a couple of minutes because I have to summarize an entire essay. Remember, under analytic idealism, every living being is what a dissociative process in one field of subjectivity looks like. And death or even near death um, is the weakening uh, or the end of that dissociation. And the, the end of dissociation is a reintegration with the cognitive space that surrounds us at all times. I can't read your thoughts or see the world through your eyes because there are two dissociative boundaries between you and me, my own and yours. And there is no way I can punch through the two of them. Perception is a dashboard representation of this cognitive world around us, which is made of uh, endogenous mental states. We represent those endogenous mental states as the stuff we see, hear, smell, taste, and so on. But those representations that we create as alters are themselves mental contents that can be remembered, episodic memories. The perceptions are themselves mental states, mental states that represent other different mental states, but mental states nonetheless. Our perceptions are mental states that are bound by the boundaries of our dissociation. So you cannot access the mental states of my perception because you're separated from them by two dissociative boundaries. But when we die, the dissociation ends. And the cognitive contents of an alter can now be reassociated or linked up with the cognitive environment that constitutes the real world in which we live, the thing that is represented by perception. Those perceptual states themselves become part of the real world. The real world is not perception, but we feed it with perceptual states, our episodic memories every time one of us dies. And those remembered perceptual states now become part of the mind at large around us. Now, each one of us sees the world from a unique point of view. When we die, we contribute the perceptual states corresponding to that unique point of view to this overmind. And as more of us dies, more of these perceptual states are contributed. And from the point of view of this mind at large around us, a perceptual map can be constructed. Because the, the way mind works is through association and dissociation. Association is things that are similar will correlate. And dissociation is the opposite. So with many of us ending our dissociations and contributing these perceptual states to this mind at large around us, similar perceptual states will start binding together. 
like, like a chemical reaction. They are reactive, they will bind together through similarity. And a perceptual map will be constructed in mind at large. A map of itself through a representation. So although mind at large is not representing itself actively, it's we doing that as alters, because we are constantly seeding it with perceptual states, a perceptual map will eventually start growing within it. You see what I mean? So my hypothesis is that when an end year says, I've seen this, I've heard that, what's happening is partly because now there is only one dissociative boundary between the end year and the thoughts of another person. Partly the end year is accessing the inner life of others. We have plenty of evidence for that. Uh, Anita Morjani describes meeting her father, but then she goes ahead and says, it was like being my father. So there she is, she's accessing the, the mental states of her father who was also dead. So there were no dissociative boundaries now preventing that. And even in some Parnia's documentary, if you pay attention, there is a part in which a, a doctor tells the story of a patient who um, had a seizure and his heart stopped. And when the patient come back, came back a week later, the patient could describe to the doctor what the doctor was thinking. Uh, um, and the doctor was embarrassed about having the thought he had had. He, he never told anyone about that. So he was floored when the guy told him, you were thinking that, how dare you think that? And it, was an, it wasn't a trivial thought. It was a very specific, very peculiar thing. So there is a patient clearly accessing the mental states of the doctor, because now instead of two dissociative boundaries, there was only one, maybe 1.1 dissociative boundary. And OK, so now we account for how in the years know what people are saying, what people are thinking, because it's easier for them in that state to access um, the mental states of other people who are present and acting during the NDE. But how do we account for that blind woman who saw a shoe on the roof of the hospital? How do we account for NDE years who not only see what other people are seeing, but see an environment, see the trees, see the house, see the cars? I think what's happening there is that they are accessing this perceptual map that is growing like a crystal in mind at large as more and more of us dies and contributes episodic memories to that. Uh, this is not a premeditated thing. It's like crystal growth. It, it, it happens spontaneously. Association happens through links of similarity. So that map becomes in, increasingly more high res, uh, so to say. Um, so if somebody ever saw that shoe on the roof and somebody saw that, Somebody lost that shoe <laughs> over there. Somebody, whoever lived uh, and died, knew that. So that was contributed to the perceptual map. And that I think that also makes sense of the fact that some NDEs and OBEs, I have had one OBE once, and, and, and that happened to me, what I'm about to describe. You seem to see the world, the real world, as it is when, when you are awake, except that certain things are not right. <laughs> Certain things deviate. Some funny things, like there's a door in the wrong place, or there is a stair that isn't really there, or it goes in the wrong direction. There are these peculiarities. It by and large seems to be this world, but it deviates from it. Well, that would be consistent with this perceptual map growing like a crystal uh, in mind at large. Um, it, it would tell you lots of things that are true, but there would be gaps, and mind does what it does. Mind interpolates the gaps through interpretation. That's what mind does. It does with us. It does in any mind. Uh, even birds do that. You know, birds hit transparent windows um, because they see a reflection and they interpolate, oh, that's another tree out there. Even though it's not 3D, it doesn't quite really look like a tree. If there is a gap, the mind fills it out and acts accordingly. So what I think an end the ear experiences is not seen without eyes. The end the ear is experiencing this model that has been built through the perceptual mental states of people who passed in the past. Um, and so that would explain also why some Parnia's experiment of putting that electronic panel on top of a, of a, a high 
uh, cupboard uh, um, in an emergency room displaying a random number selected by a computer. So you would only be able to see that if you're floating on the roof um, and not even the experimenters know what number will be displayed because it's supposed to be a double-blind experiment. Uh, and the computer randomly selects a number. And it turned out that the and the ears don't see that number. Well, of course they don't see that the number. Nobody ever saw that number. How can the end ears see the number? The end ears are not seeing through spiritual eyes. They are recalling others' recollections or accessing others' mental states. And if nobody saw that number, then the end ear can't see the number. You see what I mean? It's the wrong experiment. Um, the right. I, I could come up with better experiments, but th that's my invitation to you. I'll write that in, a, in, in an essay shortly. My invitation to you is not to think that end the years can see without eyes. My invitation to you is to think that end the years can access the mental states of mind at large, which have been seeded for millions of years with the perceptual, recollected perceptual states, the, the, the episodic memories of countless beings who have lived and died. And because of spontaneous natural association through similarity, those mental states are forming a perceptual map in mind at large, a perceptual map of itself. And that's what end the years access. They cannot see what nobody has ever seen. They cannot think what nobody has ever thought. Okay. And so uh, if Kyle has nothing else to add to that, there was there's two comments I wanted to add real quick. Something you said a little earlier before I ask this next question, just, just to kind of record my thoughts, I guess, and for the audience to think about. When you mentioned about the body remaining you know, after death and how there's that dissociating process, this kind of got me thinking about um, hmm, I wonder if this calls into question the practice of cremation. And I also was wondering about um, how there are saints uh, throughout history who've been recorded to um, their bodies have been preserved in such a way that they don't decay at the rate of normal bodies. They'll be hundreds of years. They've been dead and their bodies are still intact in ways that other bodies are not. So I wonder if uh, that, that's not something we have to explore, but it's just a thought that just to kind of throw out there that, hmm, I wonder if there's uh, something going on there. The more spiritual humans of uh, history have been preserved in different ways. That's strange. It, it could be, but I, I'll share just a personal impression with you. i rather be cremated. I, I don't want to linger. Um, it's like lingering in the state of ego death during a psychedelic experience. It's the worst thing. You want to get done with it as quickly as possible. So, so you get to the real thing. Um, so I, for one, would not hesitate saying, cremate me, cremate me quickly. Uh, we don't have the brain activity associated with feeling burns. That, that is gone in a hibernating brain. Um, otherwise, why do we need that brain activity when we feel a real burn when we are when we are awake? You see, uh, it, it would require two different accounts of the same thing, which is not parsimonious and, and, and you know stretches plausibility. So, I for one, I would rather not linger. I I I rather be cremated, and but that's my personal view. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that interesting detail. Okay, so this is this is kind of funny. I have a hard time pronouncing this guy's last name. It's Gerard. Uh, how do you say it, Kyle? Boulay. Gerard Boulay. Oh, Gerard. Okay. Oh, uh, Gerard Boulay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. My apologies. I'm embarrassed there. So American. So uh, he thinks uh, he thinks what he's about to say here is that it makes the discussion of consciousness more directed, is the point he wants to make here. <clears throat> he says he thinks the brainstem is the generator and the primary integrator of consciousness. And he cites this study claiming that, well, awareness, or rather the perception of stimuli, can be dissociated from consciousness and mind. The brainstem is the primary integrator of perceptions and responses to external and internal stimuli. And such awareness of stimuli can occur without consciousness. So for example, you know, think of autonomic responses to sound, light, pain, touches and so-called unconscious persons and all of that. So uh, what, what would you say to that? Well, there's n if Hirard is talking about autonomic functions, then there is no need to attach the word awareness or consciousness to it. Um, but I think he's talking about more. I've talked to him and um, 
he's an anesthesiologist uh, by profession, and uh, he conceded to me that uh, during general anesthesia, we are not really unconscious. We are not experiencing the pain uh, of the surgery. We are not experiencing the surgery. We know that because there are many correlates of pain, like uh, faster heart rate, higher blood pressure, and all of that is monitored. So doctors know we are not uncomfortable, we are not in pain, but you are probably not unconscious and you do not recall whatever it was that you were experiencing during general anesthesia because one of the drugs in the cocktail is a drug that does precisely that. It prevents the formation of memory pathways and it's added to the drug precisely so, so to make sure that you don't remember wherever it is. We know that what you experience is not uncomfortable because we display no signs of stress, no physiological signs of stress, but we experience something and, and Herar concedes, concedes that. Um, so I think he means more by this than, than behavioralist autonomic responses. In other words, th there are no qualities, there are no mental states, but there is a response. Uh, an autonomic response of the body, like a reflex response. I think he means more than that. I think he means that there are qualia associated with those autonomic uh, autonomic functions. In other words, there is something it is like to respond that way, uh, but it's not deliberate, self-aware human consciousness because that's linked to the neocortex. Uh, many people think it's linked to the uh, prefrontal cortex, including the people of global workspace theory. But since last year, we know that IIT makes better predictions, so it's probably linked with the parietal regions um, of the brain. Um, so yeah, I think Vurle means that there is a simple, very basic form of phenomenology of qualia states associated with autonomic functions. And those are never turned off, not even during general anesthesia. Um, the step that he takes that I don't take, I, I agree with him up to this point. Uh, the step he then takes is to say, well, and those remaining qualia, very simple qualia states associated with autonomic functions, they are generated by, I don't know, something in the brainstem or the, the cerebellum, whatever. There, I don't agree. I don't agree that they are generated by the brain, but I agree that those simple sort of bare, fundamental, instinctive qualia states are there even during general anesthesia, in, 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 in all, during all your life, even in states of deep sleep, you are never truly unconscious. So that's where I agree with, uh, with uh, Gerard. Okay. And uh, another note that I just uh, saw here kind of written down is that, <clears throat> uh, is, is that what he's saying here, it doesn't really answer the question about the fundamental nature of consciousness. And that is something also to point out as well. So he, he might think that this makes the discussion of consciousness more directed, but e even if he's, whether he's right or wrong about that, he's not even really getting at, you know, what we're really looking for, which is the actual nature of consciousness anyway. So I think, and that's my personal opinion. I think Gerard is more thoughtful about these issues than, than he lets out, than, than, than we would think by reading his uh, very skeptical material. I think there are more nuanced and cautious thoughts there than we see reflected in his writing and his interviews. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, okay. So I guess I'll just pass it off to Kyle here. I think he's got a question for you. Sorry, is it still on uh, Gerard or is it on? Uh... It's, let's see here. Because we, we just want to talk about, because uh, he does mention, this is from the Essential Foundations article he wrote on uh, yeah, uh, he still thinks that the operating system needs neurochemical anatomical structures of the brain stems of aminals in order to enable the mind. But uh, you did touch that. He said it makes it more directed. But then he he goes on to describe alternates. So he's not a fan of dualism, but mentions others like idealism, panpsychism, emergentism, uh, but states that they must be consistent with observed reality and that they have the same burden of proof. So I mean, he he seems pretty open to it. Um, I think what he also I agree. Is, yep. Uh, under anesthesia, we could be conscious, but because memory is a higher uh, level functioning of the mind, the core subjectivity operating system, 
uh, as he as he put it, is still present. Uh, this is coherent with the idea that the brainstem is still functioning, so consciousness is there too. Just like in psychedelics, the brain is silenced, but the brainstem is still active. Therefore, the idea of consciousness is present after uh, after brain brainstem is totally offline as wrong as the brainstem is the last thing to go. So consciousness will uh, will too when the brainstem does. Like it'll go away when the brainstem does. But yeah, um, you already talked about that, I think, in three different spots so far. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say when the brainstem goes, then then the dissociation is gone, not consciousness. But uh, he's using the word consciousness in the sense of personal consciousness. And in that sense, even I would agree with him. Okay. Uh, this one's going to be a really quick answer. Um, so uh, do you know about Wim Hof breathing methods and uh, two more things like that? I mean, he's not a Dutch fellow too, so. Um, I know of him. I don't know his techniques, but I know who he is, the Iceman and all that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so yeah, and a bunch of other breathing uh, meditation practices and things like that. And a bunch of people are wondering, because um, meditation under idealism and breath work, the big thing is, the mind follows the breath. So people are like, oh, you know, that, that must mean that my mind is, is being interacted by something else before it. Now it is another mental substance that's another mental thing happening within uh, analytic idealism. But I don't know, how, how would you unpack that? Yeah. That one's pretty quick. So I think there are two phases in breath work. I, I'm not an, a specialist in breath work, by the way. I've experimented experimented with it. And I can think in an educated way about it, but I'm not a specialist. I think in the beginning, when you pace your breath and you focus your attention on it, what you're doing is a form of entrainment, brain entrainment. You're causing your brain, the, the, the ebb and flow of your mind to sync up with your breath. And after that's achieved, if you slow your breath, then you slow your mind and you fall less victim to brooding, compulsive thinking, self-feeding, negative ideation, all that stuff, because you're now, uh, in, you're entraining your brain to sync up with something slower in rhythm. So that's the easy part. That's what anybody can get with breath work. But some go deeper. Stanislav uh, Grof, he had a technique of breath work that um, I think it's still practiced today. And it, it, and it is what is called breath work mainly today in which you hyperventilate. So it's not only in training your brain with slow breath, which is what most forms of meditation do, uh, Buddhist, Vipassana meditation in slow breath. So that's entrainment. But when you go to real Stanislav Grof's breath work, it's hyperventilation. There, the mechanism is different. When you hyperventilate, you substantially increase the level of oxygenation of your blood. But oxygen is a systemic poison. Most, most people don't know that, which is amazing. Uh, oxygen is a poison. Divers know that. If you're, if you're diving with uh, diox, like I used to, um, uh, you, you, it's called enriched air. So you have more oxygen in your tank than normal air has. That is poisonous. If you if you go beyond twenty meters, uh, breathing diox for a long time, uh, you can have uh, oxygen poisoning. Uh, once upon a time in the history of the Earth, like two billion years, two and a half billion years ago, um, when oxygen producing, you know, photosynthetic organism organisms arose and started producing a lot of oxygen. It caused a tremendous die-off in the planet. A lot of stuff died because oxygen is poisonous. It's reactive. It, it, it burns. Oxygen burns. So when you hyperventilate, you put a lot of oxygen in your blood, which is toxic for your brain. And your brain capillaries respond to that threat by contracting and reducing blood flow to the brain. And the mechanism is then identical to that of a psychedelic. It reduces brain activity. It reduces metabolic activity because your capillary vessels will uh, 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 shrink to prevent poisonous blood from getting to your brain cells. So that, re that metabolic reduction is probably the appearance of a reduction in dissociation, a weakening of the dissociation, an inhibition 
of the dissociation itself, which renders the dissociative boundary more porous, more permeable, so you can, you can gain access to some of your own inner states and maybe some states that are beyond you um, that you otherwise couldn't gain access to. And those may be the so-called mystical insights that people can achieve with this kind of hyperventilation-related breath work. Um, it's a mechanism similar to psychedelics because your your blood becomes toxic with hyperventilation. You know, there, there are these old movies, or maybe your grandma uh, advised you that. When you are nervous and you start having a panic attack, I never had a panic attack, but I've seen this happening. You start having a panic attack and hyperventilating, people give you a, a little bag and tell you, put it in your face and breathe through the bag. That is to prevent oxygen poisoning because you're breathing in your own co2 so even though you're breathing breathing fast you're not hyperventilating you're not over oxygenating your blood because if you do over oxygenate your blood you pass out if you sustain rapid breathing for a, a, a little long for a long while you know more than a few seconds but you sustain it you will pass out uh, because your capillary vessels in your brain will constrain so much, they will stop blood flow to your brain, and you just pass out. So that's the other mechanism. So there's brain entrainment and dissociative inhibition. Or, no, an inhibition of the dissociative process, just like psychedelics do through, through breath work. Awesome, that's really cool. Um... Am I, did you want to go to the next one or? Sure. Yeah. Unless, yeah, unless you have any comments you want to add to that. <clears throat> no. So, uh, sorry. I'm, 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 I'll be right back. Just need a quick bio break. Okay. No problem. Okay. I'll just go ahead and ask this question here. So, um, there's a couple of idealists I've been noticing. I don't know if you've heard of this guy, Dr. Nathan Hawkins. He's an idealist. Um, uh, there's other people I know, like pessimistic idealism and even myself. Uh, have brought up this point how there's sort of this in-house debate that's going on in idealism where there's representationalism or indirect realism but then there's also direct realism those who think we really do see reality the way it really is and those like yourself and maybe Hoffman who think no we really don't and uh, uh hawkins came out with a video very recently it's getting quite a bit of views and uh, he's making a point similar to those like myself and other people about this and i've already asked you about this in the past but since he just made this video i thought i'd just bring it up so he thinks that there's this self-defeating nature going on when it comes to um tr trying to use scientific studies like trying to talk about evolution to argue that we don't really see the way the world really is because we rely on our perceptions observations to know about evolution but if we're not really seeing the way the world really is then why would we think evolution is real and actually shapes our senses kind of a long-winded question but hopefully you get the spirit of the question so what would be your response to that there is something to this argument it's not a new argument um it was made years ago first by plantinga i think was his name um who argued that evolution was self-defeating because of that uh, because if you trust evolution then perception is not revealing the truth, but you base your theory of evolution on perception. So it's self-defeating that way. Plantinga was his name. He was the first one to come up with this argument many, I think 20 years ago even. Um, so th th this isn't new. Um, whatever Nathan is saying <laughs> um, uh, is maybe recycled. I, I, I don't know him, by the way. I heard the name, but I don't know him. So I think there is something to it, but I don't think um, that there is nothing to represent to to the argument of evolution for uh, representationalism on the account of that. In other words, I think we can still create coherent theories about what's going on, even though our access to what is going on is intermediated by representation and representation is not a transparent window into the world it's sort of a dashboard representation of the world why well let's stick to the metaphor of the airplane's dashboard even if the pilot is flying only by instruments and does not have a transparent windshield the states of the dashboard 
will dynamically correlate with the states of the sky in such a manner that you can still coherently theorize about the dynamics of the sky. Um, there will be correlations between the behavior of different diodes on your dashboard that will still allow you to coherently theorize about the dynamics of the external world. Now, you have to take that theorizing with a brain of salt. I, gra I grant that. Uh, but I do not grant that because all we have is the dashboard and no transparent window to see, in the to see the world as it actually is, that because of that, then all theorizing is hopeless. Now, I think that goes too far. Uh, because representations, although they don't show you the world as it is, they are supposed to convey accurate and actionable information about the world. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been useful to survival. And the argument is precisely that they are useful to survival. Um, if you close your eyes and your ears and you go for a stride in the city, uh, for a stroll uh, in the city, uh, chances are you'll be run over by a car. It, 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 you don't want that. It's very useful to have your eyes open and your ears as well. So although perception is a dashboard, not a transparent window, um, it does coherently correlate with the states of the world in a, in a way that allows for fruitful theorizing. I think to deny that would be to deny the effectiveness of science, because all science is mediated by perception. Um, and, and, and it's also to deny the very spirit of representation. The spirit of representation is that although it doesn't show you the world as it is, it will show you the world in a manner that is most optim optimal for you to traffic in the world. In other words, it's telling you relevant things about the structure and dynamics of the world. They are not the same structure and dynamics as the representation, but the representation is telling you things that do correlate with the structure and dynamics of the world. So you can coherently and fruitfully theorize through the intermediation of the representations. All right. I definitely appreciate you commenting on that, Bernardo. This is um, idealist. We all are on the same team. We're all idealists. But I know that this is a topic. It's like an in-house debate between mm -hmm. the idealists. And it's a friendly, uh, constructive debate. And I really like uh, hearing you add to that. So this next section we're going to get into here, it's about the fallibility of our minds. So this short question here, I guess, that you could ask is, um, is color perception an illusion under analytic idealism? Or just do you think idealism in general? An illusion is something that you experience, but does not correspond with states of affairs beyond that experience. So if you see uh, 18th century clipper flying in the sky, that's an illusion. You do have the experience of the clipper, but it doesn't correspond to actual states of affair in the sky beyond your experience of the clipper. That, that's an illusion. A color is not that, because colors do correspond to actual states of affair, by and large. Um, sometimes they don't. There are color illusions, like that cylinder that projects a shadow on a chessboard and, and causes you to perceive color in an inverted way, you think what's a dark square is a white square and, and the other way around. And even when you are shown the illusion and you're convinced this, in an, this is an illusion, you still see colors in that illusory way. So yes, it can happen under certain circumstances that colors are illusions. But I wouldn't say simply that colors are illusions. Colors are always illusions. No, I think they do correspond to states of affairs uh, in the world out there. It corresponds to states that are out there and not in our minds because colors are representations on the dashboard and the movement of the dials in the dashboard do correspond with the dynamics of the states out there in the sky. Colors is, is precisely that. Now, under a different def definition of illusion, then you could say all colors are illusion. If you say, 
if colors are only my mind and colors don't exist in the world out there, then they are illusions. Well, then yes, then colors are always illusions because colors only exist in our minds. They are our representations of the world created by us in our individual minds. Out there, if you see the redness of an apple, that redness exists in your mind, not in the apple out there. Um, whatever corresponds to the apple out there. Because the redness of the apple is a dial on your dashboard indicating something. The real state of the sky, the thing that corresponds to the apple, is not accessible directly to us. It, uh, our access to it is always intermediated through the dashboard. So if you say that colors are illusions because they're only in us and not out there, yeah, okay. Then under that definition of illusion, colors are illusions. But then they are, at the very least, very useful illusions because they still correspond with external objective states of affairs that aren't themselves colors, but correlate with colors very nicely in such a way that it's useful for us to have those illusions. Okay, excellent. Okay, so go ahead, Kyle. I think uh, the question is just yours here. Okay. Um... So it's about our consciousness. It's it falls into uh, some traps of unreliability. Um, one example is like if you have a stick in a water a cup of water, the stent the stick is bent, right? Um, but I guess a lot of people, uh, Noam Chomsky uses this one too. Um, consciousness follows our cognition, and our cognition is unreliable. So what our consciousness tells us about the world is fallible and wrong. But that's different from saying that consciousness is fallible. Uh, so like when I see this uh, bent stick, I see a bent stick in reflection, but it isn't actually bent. Um, but then he'll state something like, however, all these psychological processes below the level of consciousness are constructing my experience of consciousness. We'll, we'll get into Chomsky in a little bit, but this is just a prelude to that. Perception is layered. We know that. Um, before there is that experience that we call perception, um, there has been a lot of processing in our minds um, before that. We have already attached labels to certain subsets of the conscious experience. We have already attached narratives to it, explanations of origin. How is that possible? How is this the case? What will happen next? So there, there is this layer of cognition. I think all these layers are mental. A physicalist would say the initial layers are purely physical before they get translated into a mental state at the end. Uh, I disagree with that. I think they are mental from the beginning, but I still think they are layered because it's an empirical fact that perception is layered. There are experiments that can show that. And that process that cuts across these layers and constitutes these layers is obviously fallible. Um, it, it, that's undeniably so. I think the fallibility of our minds goes even beyond tricks of perception. Um, I, 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 I repeat often that the prime directive of mind is to, is to deceive itself. Mind is always busy trying to deceive itself through stories. It's, it's, reflect it, it's reflexive. It's an instinct. It's almost an aut autonomous thing. It's, it's in the nature of mind to tell itself stories and to deceive itself in doing that. Um, this, this need for an account, for an explanation, leads to this self-deception because most accounts that are constructed are, are inadequate, as they should be. Reality is only one. So if you come up with multiple accounts, most of them, perhaps except one, uh, will, will be false. Yet you need that in order to eventually have a chance to get to the one account that is closer to the truth. You need that compulsive storytelling, but that storytelling is very fallible. Uh, just look at the history of human knowledge. Just look at the history of the West. Um, it's, it, it's full of failures, full of wrong stories, wrong accounts, wrong narratives, accounts that have been useful in their time, but proved to be wrong. We fool ourselves all the time. We fool ourselves about who we are, about what's important to us, what we should do in our lives. We fool ourselves about how we are feeling. We fool ourselves about what we are really thinking. 
we tell ourselves stories about what we hope we are thinking, what we think we should be thinking, um, but we don't tell ourselves what we're really thinking. We don't tell ourselves what we're really feeling. What we say is how we think we should be feeling or how we would like to be feeling or how precisely we don't want to be feeling. Um, mind is incredibly fallible. It's very tentative. It's very grasping. Um, and that is something we have to contend with. Uh, and it, and so I think the game that we can play, it's naive to think that uh, monkeys are playing the game of ultimate truths. Um, we have evolved, what, 200,000 years ago and, and the capacity to think conceptually only 30,000 years ago, maybe 50. That, that's yesterday. Uh, it's the blink of an eye ago to think that having existed for only this very short time, we have, we have already developed a cognitive system that allows us to have an accurate account of every salient aspect of reality and self is absolutely preposterous. We are, we are grasping at straws still. Um, but there is one thing we can do and we can strive for. We can strive for being less wrong. We can strive for correcting some of our own mistakes. We can strive for getting closer to the truth. That we can strive. And I think that is the game. It's a game that acknowledges the fallibility of mind and tries to make the best out of it. And that, that's what I'm trying to do. I, I would never tell you analytic idealism is the ultimate truth. I just wrote a book in which I say flat out, it's bound not to be. And the, what I'm trying to do with analytic idealism is to be less wrong is to recognize some of the mistakes we've made and correct them such that we can make new mistakes and eventually correct them too, as opposed to getting stuck in the first mistakes, in the old mistakes, because then you're not progressing. Um, to, to, to think that we figured it all out and to deny evidence to the contrary so we can stay in that comforting illusion that we got one up on nature, that we got closure, we figured it out. To, to, to not acknowledge evidence to the contrary in order to remain in that state of illusory comfort, that I think is ethically disastrous um, because that's willful self-deception. Look, we are engaged in self-deception at all times. But it's one thing to realize when you self-deceived and then correct that mistake so you can self-deceive in a more subtle, more nuanced way later on. And it's another thing to say, no, I will not acknowledge that I'm self-deceiving because I, 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 feel, I feel better that way. So I will pretend that I'm right. That is stupid. Uh, that is noxious to, to cultural evolution. Uh, it's... it's, it's, it, it's insidious um, and almost criminal. So that's what I think we should not do. Um, but in the search for correcting old mistakes and being less wrong, we can. It's coherent to engage in that search and acknowledge that mind is fallible. And, and, and therefore, whatever you put forward now, at the end of the day, you will be wrong. And it's okay, so long as we are less wrong than we were before. So long as we corrected already some of the mistakes that we can see through right now. We can see those mistakes. So why will we insist on them? We will correct them. But that will not mean that we stopped, stopped the self-deception. We, we, we haven't. Uh, um, there are, you know, one day if I live long and I become an old man, one day I will write a book, everything I think is the case, but don't dare argue. <laughs> don't dare argue for, or don't dare defend or try to prove. Um, there is a lot more going on, Horatio, than is dreamed up in our philosophy, even analytic idealism. I think analytic idealism is closer to truth. It opens the right doors for us to go across later in order to get better at making sense of what is really going on. 
But what is really going on is not coaxed or encompassed by the story of analytic idealism. I think Robert Lawrence Kuhn would like some of the clips we were saying there about closer to truth. <laughs> I think it fits very well. Yeah. But you still think that analytic idealism has a good chance of being right in the end, perhaps, or are you just... I, I think analytic idealism is the best story we have today. And I think we will find out that it's largely right, but it does not go into the level of detail, exfoliation, nuance, and elaboration that is required to really account for what is really going on. I think the starting point that closes the doors to blind alleys prevents us from insisting on, on you know, it stops us from beating dead horses. That's the main merit of it. It stops the beating of dead horses, which is a That's waste better. of human time and energy. Um, and it opens the right doors. But I do not think it goes across all the right doors to unveil is what, what is on the other side. Because I don't think that is possible for the human cognitive system at this point. And it's not even possible for our cultural references at this point. In other words, it's not physiologically possible and not culturally possible. Um, it, I think, and I, and I don't think I'm alone in this. I think most people who are idealists and are thoughtful idealists, they know this too, which is there is more going on than can be accounted for with the clean, neat story of idealism that we are putting forward to the culture right now. It's just that what it cannot account for is not culturally acknowledged either. It is considered untrue or rumor or delusion or, you know, stuff that we don't need to spend our time on. Now, analytic idealism has a very clean story that is meant to account for everything that we do acknowledge, that we can do. But there is a lot more going on than we acknowledge. And analytic idealism doesn't try to account for that because culturally it would be self-defeating. Um, it would, for instance, have an immediate impact on how I am seen, on how my credibility is perceived because I would need to acknowledge that I take certain things seriously that the vast majority of pundits would say you shouldn't take them seriously. So I don't pollute the neat story of an analytic idealism by trying to stretch it to account for those things because it would backfire. And the cultural game is played one step at a time. Analytic idealism is a big step. Idealism, I don't, don't want to make it about my own formulation. Idealism is a big step forward as much as it is a step back to, to origins. It's an enormous step forward, which we have to make, and then we have to acclimatize to that. And to acclimatize to that step will take decades. Once we are acclimatized to it, once we are used to it, once idealism becomes our lived reality, as opposed to a conceptual idea that needs to be critiqued and evaluated, once it becomes the natural worldview, what we teach our children, once that happens, then we are fully acclimatized. Now we can try to take a bigger bite of the cake of mystery in which we are immersed. Trying to take that bite before we are acclimatized is self-defeating. It will, it will create confusion, noise. Uh, it will evoke and trigger emotions that are not useful at this point. And in saying this, I, I am not undermining analytic idealism. Um, I'm not being dishonest. The story I'm telling is the story I believe in. Actually, it's the story I live. I live my life according to that story. All I'm saying is that the story needs to be extended to really account for what is really going on. Um, but it's not useful not productive to try to do that right now. We have to acclimatize to that neat 
constrained story first before we have the solid foundation to take the next step. And the next step, if one were to tell right now on this public interview, this public trialogue and conversation we are having, if I were to just tell you what I think the next step will be, you will immediately understand why it's not useful right now. It, it's not helpful. It will just make the whole discussion unstable um, and, and to lead to some self-defensive reactions by some pundits who just say, oh, no, then I, I don't want to go there. This, this goes too far. I don't want to go there. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, it's like trying to explain general relativity and uh, quantum field theory to the great Goethe. You know, the most intelligent man of his time would be completely discombobulated if we tried to tell him the whole story. Would it be useful? No, it wouldn't be useful. No, he was engaged in an argument against Newton about the nature of color. So we, he, he was not even in, in, in the cognitive neighborhood of exploring the quantized nature of color. He was still in the debate, is it a particle, is it a wave? Uh, do all colors exist in white or not? Goethe thought, no, white is a color, it's not a mixture of colors. Newton is wrong. So, and here is the most intelligent man of his time. So the same thing applies now. It's not helpful to have a discussion about the nature of the deeper mysteries in which we are surrounded at this point. We first have to acclimatize to some of the basics. Um, and the next step will not be taken by me or you or anybody alive today. We, we can intuit it. We can loosely talk about it, as maybe one day I will if, if I get to be a very old man, but uh, not talk coherently and analytically about it. It's not possible at this point. Okay, but I guess you could say, well, illusionism and materialism, I guess, are not going to be there. <laughs> oh, no, no, that, that's just plain wrong. It's incoherent. So yeah. th this is what I meant by we can correct our mistakes. Yeah. We can advance even without the delusion that we can get to the ultimate truth. Yeah. What we can do today is to see illusionism and, and eliminativism for the insanity that they are. That we can do and we should. Okay. Because um, we'll get back. Are you still doing good for time? Because uh... Yeah, sure. Okay. Still have a couple more and then we have that argument. Um, So this one is actually funny because it does echo illusionists a little bit, but so it's these, these deeper non, they say non-conscious mechanisms in um, a lot of the psychological journals. Um, mechanisms are making higher order cognitive judgments that make us believe our conscious, uh, consciousness, um, make us believe we are conscious, sorry, and we cannot step out to observe. So I guess one of the things is um, sometimes in like, uh, for example, this video or the last one we had, uh, some guy said, well, of course, you think idealism is true, but he's like, it's it's an emergent phenomenon of the brain. And, you know, we think we do because we're immersed in it, but you can't step out and say, oh, idealism is false because we're we, we're immersed in that consciousness. Um, but that just begs the question. Um, anyway. So, we... oops, sorry. No, go ahead. Finish, finish then. No, no, I was going to just carry on with the rest of that. Okay. But it... We can never step out of our own epistemology. Not only about idealism, but also not about physicalism, not about scientific theories, not about even our biography. Um, we cannot step out into the future. We cannot step out into the past. We are always cooped up in our minds and in our epistemology. This is an invariant. It's part of of being human. It's part of the human condition. So to admit this does not favor or disfavor any particular theory or metaphysics because it's an invariant. All metaphysical theories and scientific theories arise within our minds, within our epistemology. So this is an invariant. It doesn't favor or disfavor anyone. The game is having acknowledged this 
what is the best account of what's going on based on empirical adequacy, explanatory power, conceptual parsimony, internal consistency, and overall coherence. These are the five criteria. And creating a scale of best to worst accounts based on these five criteria is possible. It doesn't give us ultimate certainty, but it is possible to rank our accounts uh, according to their degrees of adequacy to these five criteria. For instance, I cannot refute the flying spaghetti monster being the agency behind the fact that the planets orbit the sun. Maybe the flying spaghetti monster is hidden in a higher dimension and through gravity leak, it's using its noodly appendages to make the planets go around the sun. It is consistent with the empirical evidence. But these accounts scores very low in the adequacy scale based on those five criteria. It has explanatory power, but it fails in conceptual parsimony um, and fails in internal consistency as well for, for a number of reasons that I could elaborate on. So we can rank things despite being cooped up in our own epistemology. We can rank things according to more or less objective criteria. And I think we are morally obligated to do so. And then if we do that for the different metaphysical options today, I think idealism comes, up on, comes out on top. It is the most parsimonious because it does not require any type of existence other than the given, which is a mental state, which is where we start from. All theories arise within and as mental states. Um, it, is, it has the most explanatory power because it doesn't suffer from the hard problem of consciousness or the combination problem, so it has the most explanatory power. It is the most internally consistent, overall coherent, and the most empirically adequate as well because it is consistent with uh, the fact that uh, physical realism is experimentally now refuted unless you entertain some vague uh, theoretical fantasies, and also with the fact that... Um, uh, the richness and intensity of experience in some cases can be can be inverse inversely correlated with uh, the amount of brain metabolism. So I think it's the one that scores best. But in doing saying this, in saying this, I am not denying that I am always cooped up in my mind and my epistemology, and so are you, and so is everybody else. That's an invariant. All we have to be able to. Uh, 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 put things in a hierarchy of more plausible to less plausible are these five criteria. And, and I think we are morally obliged to apply these five criteria objectively as best as we can. The game is not about what can be categorically refuted. Hardly anything can be categorically refuted. The game is also not what can be categorically proven. Nothing can be categorically proven except the one given fact of nature, which is there are mental states. That is the only natural given. Nothing else can be categorically proven. So when somebody says, well, but I'm not an idealist because idealism cannot be proven. Well, nothing can. And when somebody says, well, I'm not an idealist because physicalism cannot be categor categorically refuted. Well, neither can the flying spaghetti monster. You see, it's, it's the wrong way to approach the question. It's not a productive way. The next thing is about actually about Chomsky's Chomsky's mysterianism, but um, okay, I'll get I'll get back I'll get to that after. Sorry. So just to finish up our point here, I guess a lot of these journals are echoing illusionist ideas because they're making these non-conscious judgments somewhere in the back of our minds or brains, or whatever. Uh, that the building blocks of consciousness, like qual qualia, and then they put beliefs and thoughts. They don't truly exist. Um, they'd be brought on um, like some kind of illusion. But it's like color, so it's like a species specific. Um, yeah. But then, then they do bring up some stuff. It sounds like folk psychology, and then you follow that, and you said, "Well, then that would be like the zombie. You would be essentially be zombies." And I think one of the one of the closing thoughts they had is that these thoughts are analogous to a novel about the characters. So, when you're reading a book like the novel, and you're saying, "Oh, these." really cool ideas about uh you know 
um, Mr. X or something like that. But I can't really express the subtlety, but you you know what I mean. Yeah, right? yeah. Look, um, let's let's take this seriously and let's say we are wrong about, about everything. We are cooped up in our own minds. We cannot step out of it. So we can be wrong about everything. So, so now let's take one step further and say, we are wrong about everything. Let's make this assumption for the sake of discussion. That means that everything I think to know is an illusion. It doesn't correspond to states of affair. But there is only one thing that this cannot refute, which is the existence of phenomenal states. Because if everything that I think I know is an illusion, then all I have is phenomenal states because that's what illusions are. An illusion is already an instance of that which one is trying to get rid of. So the argument is immediately self-defeating. Even if everything I think to know about the world, about the brain, about consciousness, about self, about reality, all of that is wrong then there is still one thing that is absolutely true, which is there are phenomenal states. There are experiential states. Because that illusion is an instance thereof. If I'm wrong about everything, then I'm still right about there being phenomenal states. You cannot get behind that. You cannot possibly get rid of that. And all the hand-waving of eliminativism and, 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 and illusionism is an attempt to subtly linguistically redefine the word consciousness in a way that make it mean something that it doesn't mean and then deny that that exists. Well, you can do that, but you still didn't get rid of what consciousness actually means, the way we use the word uh, in everyday life. So it, it, it's, an, it's an unbelievably silly game that can only be played by very intelligent minds. Because you see, for you to deceive yourself on something that is plain obvious, you have to be incredibly intelligent in order to be able to hide the obvious from yourself. You have to engage in an acrobatic dance of concepts and ideas to hide the obvious truth from yourself. It demands very high intelligence to do that. If you ask a regular person on the street, could you be deluded about the fact that you're conscious? People will look at you and say, are you joking? Is this a prank? Obviously not. Of course I am conscious. Only highly educated and highly smart philosophers can deny that. <laughs> yeah, that was, I agree. <laughs> that was really well said. And I remember I had an email with uh, David Scribine about that too. He said, if you're going to, throw away mind anything goes yeah and yeah i thought that was really well said so falling on the sword and that was funny how i'm gonna refute all this and then well actually big catch 22 <laughs> that was really cool okay so uh this next question here is that uh so some philosophers debate the terminology of consciousness and say the interesting question is whether or not there is a dual relationship here so they say that uh it is between illusion or the seeming and consciousness. So is there a separation between the seeming and what the seeming seems to perceive? Is it all internal or is it something real and external? I, I'm reminded of a, a video clip of Richard Feynman talking about philosophers. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Um, when he's asked the question, when you see a fork, do you actually see the fork or do you see just the photons reflected by the fork? And Feynman gets exasperated and says, ah, only dopey philosophers can think about these things in this way because one thing implies the other, obviously. Um, and of course, I think Feynman was wrong. There is subtlety here to be explored. Um, but there is a sense in which he was right, which is that only philosophers... <laughs> go to this kind of conceptual acrobatics. Is there a distinction between the seeming and the thing that the seeming seems to refer to? In case of phenomenal states, I don't think there is. Because the seeming of a phenomenal state is a phenomenal state. Now, it may not be 
the same phenomenal state. But it is phenomenal. Uh, in other words, the seeming that I'm having a certain feeling is the feeling. Because for me to seem that I'm feeling anger, I have to be angry. For me to, 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 to think that I feel like I am sad, it, it feels as if I were sad, then you are sad. Otherwise, it wouldn't seem that you were sad. The seeming to be sad is the sadness. In some other cases, it's not quite straightforward. Like, I seem to have understood this. But did you really understand this? And this is a case in which the seeming of understanding may not be the same phenomenal state as the understanding. The understanding may feel different than the seeming of understanding, but they are both phenomenal still. So when you are talking about phenomenal states in general, in other words, mind states, conscious states, things that there is something it is like to be in that state, uh, and we ignore the qualitative differences between the states, then the seeming that you have a phenomenal state is perforce a phenomenal state because seeming is a phenomenal state by definition. Now you can redefine the word, but then you're not doing anything useful. You're playing a game. So I think now in, in the case of the heart problem and in the case of you know, talking about phenomenal states as a kind of existence, then the seeming is the thing that the seeming seems to indicate. Okay, perfect. I got to say, um, <laughs> though I know the question is here and I wanted to ask it, I have the same attitude as you about uh, such thinking and such questioning about, well, the seeming and the seeming and all that. It just gets brought up, so it had to be asked. But I feel the same way as you that, I mean, this is what happens when you have dualistic thinking. You know, it's like you you try to separate them. And if you're, just, if you're more of a monist, you just see right through it and you just... You can just embrace common sense like it seems to be the case so that's what it is whatever i don't have to yeah, twist myself happens, in these knots here this happens when it's obvious that one has committed an internal contradiction in one's line of thinking but one is too emotionally committed to that line of thinking so one has to figure out a way to avoid the obvious contradiction and, and then you end up in discussions like this exactly so thank thank you for entertaining that question there for sure <laughs> so uh yeah go ahead there kyle um, one quick, uh, quick thing there, MI. So I'll do this on tick. Um, can we squeeze in Chomsky and then get to the argument? And is that is that okay? Yeah, okay. sure. Yeah, take all the time you need. Um, this is just quick. You can throw your sentence in here, but I know a lot of people had a concern about ontic structural realism last time we we talked to. Um, so I did some research. Um, and a bunch of panpsychists, um, so those that are using the Russellian argument for intrinsic natures. Um, so they think this is a great refutation, I do too, to say that ontic structural realism is true, which for a refresher is that there's nothing but relations and there's nothing to ground it and it's turtles all the way down. Um, so there's um, uh, there's there's one really good argument. It's uh, Newman's Dilemma, which was written back in the 1920s, that if the structure of the world does not have an intrinsic grounding, that of which can only be the one we are aware of, which is consciousness. Um, you can see William Seeger for that, uh, Hedda Hasselmerk, they have great arguments for that. Uh, then the structure slash relations would lapse into a world not having a concrete reality distinguishable distinguishable from the abstract mathematical and fall into Pythagoreanism, which is considered false. So uh, that's beautiful. And, <laughs> oh, and yeah, that, that's a, that's the direct implication of ontic structural realism, which is the world is ungrounded. Um, but we, we discussed it last time. I don't know whether you want to go over that again. D Sorry, this is actually a good one too. Um, so for this, it's for the last bit of the talk. Um, some philosophers will classify you as a, a Russellian in your uh, idealism. Is that true? Do you I will deny any label other than idealism. <laughs> um, I acquiesce to that label. But uh, the reason I would deny labels is that the history of philosophy is the history of mislabeling. Labeling. It's the history of trying to squeeze what one has had to say through a lifetime 
into a tiny little drawer that uh, gives people an excuse to not study what the person actually said because they think they know what he said based on that label alone. You see, I see this happening to, to Kierkegaard. I see this happening to, to, to Spinoza, uh, to Hegel, to, to Schopenhauer, Kant, um, even, uh, um, even um, Wittgenstein is a victim of that. So I, I disclaim any label that anybody else places on me other than the label I, I acquiesce to myself. I have acquiesced to the label idealist because it's general enough. Um, I think uh, Russell, whether he said that explicitly in the 19, 1920s or not, uh, I think he assumed, because for him it was a self-evident fact, that the structure of nature is the structure of matter. So in his monism, in which physical properties and mental properties are all properties of the one substrate, that one substrate would still have the structure of matter because that's what is discernible on the screen of perception. So if that's how you interpret, uh, are you talking about Husserl or Russell? Russell, right? Russell, yeah. Yeah, so if that's how you interpret Russell, which is I think how most people would interpret Russell, I would deny that I that I fit into that label, because I do not think the structure of matter is the structure of the world as it is in itself. I think the structure of matter is the structure of the screen of perception. It's just like you know I'm I'm seeing you now on a window on my computer, and if I get very close to your image, I can see the pixels. Well, in this case, I can't see because I'm using a retina display and it's impossible for me to discern it. But if I were using the display I have back there on a Windows computer, if I got close to your image, I would see little rectangles, each rectangle with a single color. And I would then say, imagine that I would then say, oh, Kyle is made of little rectangles, each one with a single color. That's the structure of Kyle. No, that's ob obviously false. That's the structure of Kyle's representation on my screen, not the structure of the thing represented. So in exactly the same way, I think sub uh, elementary subatomic particles and quantum fields, they determine the structure of the screen of perception, not of the thing represented by the screen of perception. Subatomic, ele elementary subatomic particles are the pixels of the screen of perception, not the pixels of the things represented by the screen of perception. And I don't think Russell had this subtlety. I, at least I have never seen, I'm, I'm not a student of Russell, but I have never seen this uh, mentioned in Russell's work. I think as a positivist, which he was, or at least highly influenced by the, by the, the positivist movement, I think he took the structure of perception for the ontic structure of the world as it is in itself. And everything followed from that. And I don't make that assumption, so I would deny this label. But I haven't read the paper in which people assign that label to me. So maybe they have more nuance and subtlety than I'm assuming them to have used. And, and maybe they have a point. I don't know. But based on what you're saying, I would, I would disclaim an association with Russell Monism. Okay, so... David Scribina actually brought this up too. He said that this does go back to Schopenhauer, and we know you definitely are Schopenhauer. Um, so yeah, the science describes the, the structure, mass, charge, spin, etc., but not things in themselves. And the only uh, thing that needs to be grounded, which we need from that argument that refutes ontic structural realism, well, is some kind of intrinsic property. And the only one that we know of is consciousness. So um, yeah, and then, I yeah, mean- so I I agree with this, but here's the difference. So I agree with this. Science only describes relations, behaviors. Behaviors are forms of relation, um, like movement. It doesn't describe the things that actually move. It doesn't describe the relata, the things that relate, the intrinsic nature of things. I agree with that. And that you find in Russell in a, a book that has matter in the title. I, for, I forgot the title. Um, the problem of the, it's the, the problem of matter. Yeah. The problem of matter. Yeah. Um, so I agree with that. But here is where we find a bifurcation in the road. Once you acknowledge that uh, mind is the intrinsic nature of things, 
do you still say that the structure of mind is the structure of things as discernible on the screen on, on the screen of perception? Or do you say that the structure on the screen of perception is just a representation of things as they are in themselves? And therefore, the structure of mind is not necessarily the structure of things as they appear on the screen of perception. If you think that the screen of perception corresponds one to one, um, with things as they are in themselves. In other words, if you deny representationalism, if we say, if you say, what we perceive is the world as it is, structure-wise, not in terms of the qualities, color, taste, smells. No, forget that. That's not in the world. But the geometrical relationships, the contours, the silhouettes. If you say the contours of the screen of perception, the geometrical structure, discernible in perception, is the geometrical structure of the world, then there are these geometrically isolated, bound things in the real world that, that, that we call subatomic particles. And they have spatial boundaries. And the way they distribute themselves with respect to one another geometrically would then determine the structure of mind because mind is the intrinsic nature of these particles. So mind must be fragmented as the particles. Now, this is what I deny. I deny this. I agree that... Um, Whatever is out there has to have an intrinsic nature because to have intrinsic nature is to be. To have properties, you have to have intrinsic nature. To be is to have properties. To be is to have intrinsic nature because everything else is ungrounded. It becomes turtles all the way down or movement without the things that move. Um, but I deny that the structure of the mind that constitutes the intrinsic nature of things is the structure of the material world discernible on the screen of perception. Because otherwise, I would have to say that the structure of your mind is little rectangles as I discern on my screen. That's the mistake, is to see the pixels that constitute your image on my computer screen, in other words, a representation of what you are, and then say, the pixels need an intrinsic nature, so the pixels are minded, but that mind is organized according to rectangular little, little blocks. Now, I deny that, because I don't think you're made of rectangular li little blocks. I think only your representation is made of rectangular li little blocks. In exactly the same way, I don't think the world as it is in itself is made of spatially bound elementary subatomic particles. That's the structure of the screen of the representation. I think mind is the intrinsic nature of the world, but that intrinsic nature is not distributed according to the structure of subatomic particles, because subatomic particles are the pixels of the representation of the world as it is in itself. You see, you see the distinction I'm trying to make? Yeah, yeah, I do. That's definitely, that's definitely different. Um, so I'll have to come back to that for our argument, but before we uh, do that... This, this is Schopenhauerian too, by the way. Schopenhauer denied that the will had the structure of, uh, of perceptual representations. Uh, that, that is his Principium Individuationis. He says uh, you need extension, space-time, to, uh, to describe the structure that we perceive, perceptual representations, or uh, the name he gave for it, uh, perceptual representations is, is the best, uh, the, the clearest way to say. Um, but he denied that the structure of the will was the structure of that we could discern in perceptual representations. He said the will is unified. It, uh, it, it, it is not individuated in parts because it's not in space and time. So he said the same thing. He, 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 he was with Russell in saying that the intrinsic nature of the world is mental stuff because the will is mental. To will is a mental process. Um, but he denied that uh, the will, as it is in itself, beyond our perceptual representations, had proper parts. In other words, it didn't inherit the structure that discernible uh, in the uh, perceptual representations, because the structure of perceptual representations was created by our cognitive system. We create space-time. We categorize the world. We break it up in parts. But all of these parts exist only in us. It's not out there. They are an artifact of the screen, like pixels. They are not the structure of the thing represented on the screen. The will this does not have the structure of perceptual representations under uh, Schopenhauerian philosophy. He's, he is blunt, clear about this, and he repeats himself multiple times on this point. 
Okay. Uh, Emma, you're definitely going to have to help me because the, the argument later, <laughs> it's going to be difficult, but I'm going to try. Um, just real quick before we start that, um, I just want to get your take on uh, Chomsky. Um, a lot of people are very confused with him. Um, he's he's done a, quite a bit of interviews uh, the last year and some. He's talked to a lot of guys on YouTube. Um, but I, th I think, so yeah, I think he subscribes to new, uh, new Mysterianism. But here's what he does. So first and foremost, he's not an illusionist. But sometimes he talks like one. Um, he thinks that mind is a is a is matter organized in a correct way that gives rise to consciousness. So he's some kind of emergentist. But then he takes the full uh, Russell argument and says that uh, materialism cannot be true because we don't know what matter is. It doesn't mean anything. He states that Russell Eddington view that matter could be consciousness, or at least we cannot say that it is not conscious, but says we need to only posit what we have evidence to believe. And we know something about matter, and he names some structural characteristics, but doesn't say anything about consciousness. But now he says he thinks the what it is like questions, what it's like to see a sunset, uh, what it's like to see the color red, um, you know, the problems of the heart, the questions of the hard problem of consciousness experience are impossible interrogative questions that are meaningless. Uh, he says a little bit more, but I just want to know what you think, because that could be that could open up so much. I, I haven't followed his latest uh, statements on metaphysics. Uh, what I remember from him is that he's definitely not a physicalist uh, for reasons you, 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 you alluded to. Um, but to say that the question of what it is like to be is senseless is to not have understood the question. Um, because it is the most, uh, th this is the question that has the most obvious and irrefutable answer of all possible questions. That there is something it is like to be is obvious. It's all we have. It's all that ever happens is what it is like to be us. Um, and even when I extrapolate from that and I say there is something it is like to be you, then that act of extrapolation feels like something to me. There is something it, feel, it feels like for me to extrapolate consciousness towards you too. So all we ever, ever have, will have, have had, and could possibly have is what it is like to be. And, and this, is, this is either obvious, to somebody who understands the question. Or maybe to some, maybe to Chomsky, it is so obvious that this cannot possibly be the meaning of the question. It, they must mean something else by the question. Uh, and, and then you get into difficulties. But no, the meaning of the question is exactly what it seems. There is something it is like to be me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here talking. Um, and, and, and that's obvious. It's nature's only given. There is nothing meaningless about it. It's the most direct, self-evident question there is. I, I completely agree, and a lot of the interviewers did as well. But, I mean, I could be getting raked over the coals in the future for saying this, so maybe I'm misunderstanding Chomsky too, but there's, there's, it seems like there's something wrong. Now, he does mention, so back with Newton and Descartes, he says this is the classic mind-body problem. Um, and he... Descartes and Newton were talking about um, exercising the ghost in the machine, but then Newton did it, and he couldn't believe his answer because it's not the ghost was gone, the machine was gone, and that sounds really idealistic. And Chomsky says that uh, that the old mind-body problem of dualism and monism was settled with Newton, but the idea of matter was shattered as a vacuous, meaningless term, and we use physical as an honorific term of what is real. So meanwhile, the contemporary mind problem is impossible and it is a confused and non-formulated question, so it cannot be answered. Uh, that's super controversial. Uh, no, this doesn't compute uh, to me. Um, and look, I can't presume to know what he actually meant, but I, I will comment on the topic. Um, to think that the mind-body problem was settled by Newton is a form of what um, theologians call, um, 
I forgot the technical term. There is a technical term for emptying yourself out of something. Kenosis. It's a form of kenosis. Because um, what, it, what it means is that if you think that by describing the world as perceived, you described everything. That, that's what it means to say that Newton solved the mind, mind, mind body problem. If you describe the contents of perception and predict the contents of perception correctly, then you've described all of nature. It's the only way you can say Newton solved the mind body problem, is by saying that Newton described everything. And since what Newton described was the things that are perceived, then things that are perceived are all there is. In other words, the states of perception, the quality of perception, the things we see, smell, touch, taste, they are all there is. That is obviously wrong, because we also have thoughts that are real. They may not be what we think they are, but they are real as experiences, and, and these experiences are not perceptual. I can be in a dark, silent flotation tank in which I have no perceptual states whatsoever and still have a very rich experiential life full of thoughts, full of emotions, full of insights, fantasies. So obviously Newton didn't describe the whole of nature. To say that is to say that there are no endogenous mental states that are not describable in Newtonian terms. And obviously there are endogenous mental states. We are all acquainted with them. Whatever they are, they exist as mental states. You can say, oh, they can be reduced or they are illusory. Yeah, you can see all of this stuff, but there are mental states that are not describable in a Newtonian form. So I would disagree even with the premise of what you read, which is that with Newton, the mind-body problem is solved. No, to say that is to say that there are only perceptual states and not endogenous states. There are, it's to say that there are no thoughts, there are no emotions, no feelings, no fantasies, no insights, no intuitions, and that's obviously not true. So but I, I disagree <laughs> starting from the premise already. I think Chomsky is perhaps inadvertently engaging in physicalist reduction here, um, assuming that thoughts can be reduced to Newtonian describable uh, physical states. Well, but if you say that, now you're begging the question of metaphysics, because the metaphysics is precisely the point in contention. So you cannot make an argument for it by assuming your favorite answer <laughs> uh, 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 to, to the question. So short of some uh, unexamined and, and question-begging reduction step, I disagree with the premise. Yeah, he, he's, he maintains his mysterianism, uh, but he does that thing with matter. It could be whatever, but that but that organized matter that creates the mind he says that that could be panpsychism that could be idealism that could be x y or z uh but then but then he'll go on and say panpsychism or an idealism they don't explain anything their their descriptions uh here their, their descriptions but do not answer anything useful but a misguided unformulated question uh, he thinks that the hard problem is isn't there it's just it's just a brain process but it's beyond our current understanding or it's just a cognitive limit it's very contradictory uh, maybe it's not and i just don't understand it but that's what a lot of us have it, it sounds contradictory to me um maybe don is not reading enough newspaper clips any, anymore I, I i don't know he's busy with too many things you know uh, um, how can we really say that the question that, that, that there are no answers without knowing the literature to some degree, which I don't know how he would have time to know given everything else he's commenting on. Um, and my attitude, well, Mysterianism is not an acknowledgement that we don't have an irrefutable answer. We don't have an irrefutable answer. I acknowledge that and I'm not a Mysterianist. Uh, Mysterianism is to say that we cannot have an adequate answer. Um, and this is not totally incoherent. Um, it is entirely coherent to think that primates that have evolved on this planet only a couple of hundred thousand years ago do not have the cognitive apparatus that would be required to make sense of a great many things that are important to us. It's coherent to say that. It's even likely. Um, but I think it's also defeatist. It's uh, um, um, unnecessarily too pessimistic 
Because the fact that we cannot get to the ultimate answer, to the ultimate truth, because we are just monkeys that evolved a couple of hundred thousand years ago, in other words, yesterday, to admit to that does not mean that it's unfruitful to try. It can be fruitful to try to get to the ultimate answer, even if you know that you can never get there. Because in the process of trying, you will be less wrong. You will correct mistakes. You get closer, even if you can never get there. We can overcome our own mistakes, even if we can't overcome our intrinsic limitations as a species, you see? So our, bi our biology, the configuration of mind that we are, which has evolved on planet Earth over all these years, that biology, that, conf that mental configuration imposes on us certain constraints that we can never overcome. We could only overcome them by being something other than we, we are. And we are what we are, so we can't overcome the constraints determined by what we are. I acknowledge that. But even within those constraints, within the bounds of our cognition, we can get certain things right and other things wrong, according to the criteria of our own cognition. In other words, internal consistency, logical adequacy, empirical adequacy. Um, these are things we do have control over, and they are within the space encompassed by the limits that are physiologically imposed on us, anatomically and, and, and genetically imposed on us. In other words, we can do better within this limited field. And the way to do better is to pretend that we can get to the ultimate truth and try to get to it. We are never going to get to it as human beings, as homo sapiens, but we can, in the process of trying, uh, eliminate, solve, and overcome some of our own mistakes mistakes made within the, the confines of what is possible to us, we can do better. Uh, we can improve uh, our theories, our worldview. We can make them more empirically adequate. We can make them more internally consistent. We can see through the previous contradictions of our lines of thinking. We can see how we deceived ourselves before. We can notice how prejudice biases our narrative making. All of these things are possible. And Mysterianism sort of gives us an excuse to not to try to get to get it better, not to try to do better. Uh, and I think that is not valid. Um, we have mainstream mistakes today that are demonstrably mistakes. Physicalism, one of the most horrible and self-evident mistakes in the history of philosophy. And here we are, it's still the mainstream worldview. We should do better than this. The problem is that the way our minds work, we cannot abandon errors, previous errors, without replacing them with a new story. Uh, our mind uh, abhors a vacuum of narratives. In order to be alive and relate to the world productively, we need to have a narrative that makes sense of, of the world to us. So we cannot discard previous mistakes without filling the space that is made empty by that with some other theory, some other narrative, some other account. Um, and that's why we need analytic idealism, not only to deny physicalism, not only to deny constitutive panpsychism. We need to put something else in place of that. Otherwise, we are exposed to the very fair criticism. You think I'm all wrong? Then go ahead, do better. What, what, what's your alternative? And if you say, I don't have an alternative, I just know that you are wrong, then people go, yeah, you see, you're just a bullshitter. Um, and, and, and this is fair. It's fair. You can't just go saying everybody else is wrong without offering an alternative. Even if you know deep inside your mind that ultimately that alternative is at least not complete in a very significant way, uh, we have to put something else in place of our errors when we discard our errors. And that's why it's useful to pretend that we can get to the ultimate truth, because it gives us a direction to pursue in order to create these alternatives with which to replace past errors. And that's how analytic idealism comes in, as opposed to just a critique of physicalism and panpsychism. So I think Mysterianism, rigorously speaking, strictly speaking, is right. Monkeys are not in the business of figuring out the ultimate truth. But in practice, it's dysfunctional. 
because it leads to a kind of apathy that is unnecessary. We can do better. We can revise older mistakes, see through them, and replace them with better narratives. They are not the ultimate truth, but it's still better. And that will still improve our lives, will allow us to live more authentic uh, uh, lives, richer lives. And that we should do. And I think Mysterianism, whether intentionally or not, undermines this. I just want to say real quick, I agree with that. And that, that's one of the reasons why I think it's important to identify as an idealist, because we can refute materialism all we want. But just like you said, it's just human psychology. We have to fill that vacuum in there. And it's just the best one available is idealism. Yeah. So it's just better to just come out and say it. I'm an idealist. Idealism is true. And that's how we replace materialism. Absolutely. I Totally agree. That's the cultural game. Unfortunately, to play the cultural game, we have to do it with words and labels. There is no other way. Before we move on, then, I think Chomsky, then, he says emergence, but it sounds like weak emergence. And I know when we talked about Carol last time, too, he is a weak emergentist. Um, do you have, what, what, what gives you, I don't know, a good refutation for you that says, okay, well, weak emergence is wrong, because you definitely have worked with emergence quite a bit with computer engineering, et cetera. So. Yeah. Uh, depends on what one understands by the word physical substrate. Um, based on previous writings of Chomsky, I haven't, again, I haven't followed what he wrote the past few years, but in, on previous writings, it's, it was obvious to me he's not a physicalist. In other words, he doesn't take the physical substrate to be something that can be exhaustively described through a list of numbers, something that lacks qualities and only has quantifiable parameters. I, he, he's, he doesn't seem to be that. Uh, he keeps room open to be filled with qualitative states, phenomenal states. So if that's Chomsky's understanding of the brain, then it is coherent to think of human consciousness as weakly emergent from lower level qualia states. Because you start with qualia states, you end with qualia states, but different states, that's weak emergence. You end up with new properties, but properties which can be deduced in principle from the properties you started with. So that's coherent. Sean Carroll, I don't think, has this understanding of physicality. I think he's a physicalist. He thinks physical stuff is exhaustively describable with the list of the right numbers. If you provide the list of the right numbers, then you will have said everything there is to say about physical entities. In other words, they have no qualia states. In that case, it is incoherent to say that human consciousness is weakly emergent from the brain that lacks qualia states because you cannot deduce the emergent properties from the properties of the mi micro components that constitute the system to begin with. You cannot pull what it is like to see the color red from, what is it, 3.2 terahertz or 2.7 terahertz, whatever, whatever it is, that, that is the physical quantity that describes the color red. Even if you know all of those numbers, but you're colorblind, you will still not know what it is like to see the color red because there is a qualitative component to this, to it, um, <clears throat> that cannot be deduced in principle from quantities alone. So in that case, then it's incoherent for Carroll to be a weak emergentist. If he thinks physical things do not have uh, inherent uh, phenomenal properties, then it is incoherent for phenomenal properties to emerge out of purely quantitative stuff. Uh, why? Because the definition of weak emergence is that the emergent properties may be non-obvious and counterintuitive if you look at the properties of the components of the system, but they still can be deduced from the properties that you start with. For instance, <clears throat> it is counterintuitive and non-obvious to deduce the shape of a snowflake from the properties of water molecules. But it is possible. 
as counterintuitive and non-obvious as it is, you can write down a few mathematical equations that describe the properties of water molecules, and you can run a simulation on your computer, and you will see the shapes of snowflakes emerge on your screen, which proves that you can deduce the shape of snowflakes from the properties of water molecules. It's not obvious, it's not intuitive, but you can. You can do the same thing for the shapes of um, sand dunes. It is not intuitive or obvious to derive the shapes of sun dunes from the properties of sand grains and wind. But it is possible, so much so that you can run a simulation on, on your computer that starts only with the properties of sand grains and wind, and you will see sun dunes being formed on your screen. You would be able to deduce those forms if you apply the equations consequently. But you cannot do that for consciousness. You cannot start with the first principles of foundations of physics and end up with the qualities of experience. That's why in the case of consciousness, Dave uh, Chalmers talked about strong emergency, which was precisely to differentiate it. It was meant to, to allow people to still use the word emergence, but in a completely different sense. Uh, strong emergence has nothing to do with weak emergence. Strong emergence is an appeal to magic. It's when the emergent properties cannot at all be deduced from the properties you started with. You only know that they come together because of a brute fact correlation. You know, as a brute fact, an observation that uh, uh, our uh, uh, conscious states are correlated with patterns of brain activity. And therefore, we can use language and say, well, then consciousness is strongly emergent from brain states. That's an appeal to magic because nobody can say how that works. You're just putting a label on a gap, a miracle. And, you're, and instead of calling it a miracle, which is what it is, that's what you're appealing to, some kind of miracle. Um, instead of that, you use technically sounding words like strong emergence to hide the fact that you are hand-waving and appealing to some kind of divine miracle. Um, so for you to use the word emergence on a strict physicalist sense and apply that to consciousness, you, you have to mean it as strong emergence. In other words, as the appeal to a miracle. Yeah, because weak emergence, and I think Galen Strassen hints at this too, if you are a realist about consciousness, it would entail panpsychism in a sense, because uh, what... What does not have cannot give is the slogan, I think, um, if it's not already there at the bottom. So, I mean, if you're a weak emergentist and realist, you can be an idealist or a panpsychist. But, um, yeah, unless you want to be an illusionist of some sort. Uh, which the, the key thing that distinguishes uh, a constitutive panpsychism <clears throat> from cosmopsychism or idealism is that the constitutive panpsychist will attribute to consciousness, fundamental as it may be, the structure of matter as discernible on the screen of perception. In other words, consciousness will be carved out into multiple little blocks of consciousness associated with uh, elementary subatomic particles. Uh, if, if matter is fragmented, then so is consciousness for the uh, uh, um, constitutive panpsychist or bottom-up panpsychist or micro-panpsychist, whatever you want to call it. For the idealist, that's not the case. The structure of consciousness is not the structure of matter. Consciousness is unitary. It's one field of subjectivity. And matter is a, represent, is a representation of processes in consciousness. And that representation has structure, just like images on my screen are pixelated. But that structure is an artifact of the representation, not of the thing represented. Um, yeah, so uh, the, this is basically the last section. There's a couple of questions and other things, depending on how much time you have, of course, but it's the space-time argument. So this is pretty much the last block. Yeah, let's complete it. Uh, let's let's finish it up today. I like this that. This is idea. already the, the second part. <laughs>
Yeah, and I want to say thank you again for for being so gracious with your time. I'll edit this out too before we get to the question, but I just wanted to thank you again. It's always a privilege. And you're so uh, you know gracious with your time. So thank you again, for thank being you. interested in, in my stuff. Many are not. <laughs> oh, it's our pleasure. We're fascinated. We can't get enough. So here, I'll go ahead and let Kyle go. Okay, so we're gonna do something a little different. It's it's gonna be hard. So just disclosure to everybody, we're, we're trying our best. Um, obviously, Castle Jump is going to understand it far better than us. But uh, this is from um, Dr. Damien Alexiev from uh, the University of Vienna. And it's called The Space-Time Argument Against Panpsychist Idealism. However, with some terminology, it it, it is it is applicable to idealism. Um and I will be condensing it quite a bit, but we'll get to some parts of what's most important. So the author argues that idealist panpsychism, we'll just use idealism from here, is false because it cannot account for space-time structure. We already did talk about structure too, so it might just be a non sequitur, but the author says that, the, that we would need to abandon a pure idealism in favor for something that would include something like thinning laws in order to account for macro subjects differentiating from the fundamental mind how do macro subjects um, from the fundamental like how do we get macro subjects from the fundamental mind uh, without the macro subjects just being an aspect of the fundamental mind um, that'll, that'll be the first part um, can we address this before you yeah I was just going to just read about metric real quick um, okay. so Metric for what we're going to differentiate between, because part of the argument is to have metric everywhere or not everywhere, and that'll tell us. So space-time, according to general relativity, has a metrical structure. In geometry, a metric is a structure that determines distances. In ordinary life, by distance, we typically have in mind like a Euclidean distance, like Pythagorean theorem. Uh, anyway, so the space-time metric is formally defined as a pseudometric, where a pseudometric violates constraints and the range is not limited to positive quantities. So you could have negative, neutral, null. All right. So the first one is how do we get macro subjects from the mental mind without them just being an aspect of the fundamental mind? Does he explain why he thinks this is an intrinsic limitation of idealism? Because, because I mean, you can always say, but if, if you don't argue why, then I, I will just repeat a story that I've already, already said many yeah. times. One of the problems is that when, so Philip Goff answered this question and he said, well, and I actually wrote him too, and we talked about thinning laws, because if it's just an aspect, there should be metric everywhere, but there is not no metric everywhere. Um, it's, okay. yeah, and then he said thinning laws, but then when I wrote uh, uh, Damien back, he said, well, thinning laws would mean an impure idealism, so my argument holds. There was something else besides just pure experience, and that's DID or the thinning laws or something. Yeah, I, I hate when people invent jargon and use it as if it were an argument instead of just saying what is it that they mean. Um, so let me just tell you the story of analytic idealism, and then we try to relate it back. <clears throat> Under analytic idealism, there is only one thing, one subject. That's all there is. And we can visualize that subject as a field, spatially unbound field. And we can visualize particular experiential states, which can be discerned from one another, as particular local patterns of excitation of the field. This is exactly what quantum field theory does for elementary particles. They are local patterns of excitation of the field. So I, I borrow from that and say there is only one subject and particular differ differentiable uh, mental states or phenomenal states are particular local patterns of excitation of the subject itself. Therefore, there is nothing but the subject for the same reason that there is nothing to a vibrating guitar string but the guitar string. In other words, what we call experiential states are just doings of the subject. They are not something on top of the subject. They are not an extra thing that you add in. There is nothing to a phenomenal state other than the subject who experiences the phenomenal state. Because a phenomenal state is a pattern of excitation of the subject. Okay, so his, his follow-up would be, 
uh, so we're using emergence here, but we could say submergence with decombination. Um, anyway, they say strong emergence, but anyway, he says we would have, hold on a second. The subjects, if we can get, were well, the subjects reduced down to anything over and above the fundamental? So would we reduce, are we something over and above the fundamental? No. We... No. There is only one subject, and it's you, it's me, it's my cat, it's everybody else. The subject that's looking out into the world through your eyes is the same subject that looks out into the world through my mind. I, I know the question's coming up in your mind, but we are spatially distinct. How do you make sense of that? I'm going to get there. So first, just the starting point. There's only one subject. And it's the thing looking out from your eyes. It's the thing looking like from my eyes. The reason we think these subjects are different is that the experiences of the same subject are different. Um, you can, you are seeing the world from a different perspective than I do. So your perceptual states are different from mine. You have different thoughts than I do. So your thought landscape is different from mine. But notice that your thoughts are experienced by you in a way very similar to how you experience the trees along the street as you walk down the street. So you are walking down the street of certain thoughts. This one subject, when it comes to you, is walking down the street of certain thoughts and emotions and memories and narratives and theories. And it's walking, the same subject is walking down another lane with different landscapes, a different landscape of, landscape of thoughts, dispositions, emotions, memories, narratives of self, theory. It's the same subject walking down different streets. You see what I mean? The experiential content is the same, but the, ex sorry, the experiential content is different, but the experiencer is the same. Going for a stroll down the lane of Kyle and going for another stroll down the lane of Bernardo. Now, is it coherent to say that one subject can be having different but simultaneous experiences? It's entirely coherent. It's happening to you right now. What you see from your right eye is different from what you see from your left eye. And you can, you can see that clearly. Just put your finger here, close one eye. You see this part of the finger. Now do the other. Oh, you see a different part of the finger. You are seeing two different things with each of your eyes. It's just that your mind reconciles them. And we call it three dimensions. The third dimension is what is created through this reconciliation. But if you are dissociated, you don't reconcile them. It's just one subject having two different experiences. So that's the idea of dissociation. So under analytic idealism, we account for macro subjects through the phenomenon of dissociation. And dissociation is a lack of association. It's not a thing in and of itself. It may be actively enforced, but it's a lack of something. It's a lack of cognitive association. The cognitive association you perform when you reconcile the image from your right eye to the image of your left eye. If you take that out of the equation, you are left with two images, different experiences, experienced by the same subject at the same time, and yet different and non-associated with one another. That's the idea. Now, how does that happen? How does dissociation happen? And that, that's a critique Philip has had for a long time of analytic idealism, which is I, I make an empirical appeal because dissociation is an established fact now in the 21st century since the advent of neuroimaging 20 odd years ago. We know it happens. It looks like something in a brain scanner. You can diagnose DID with fMRI. You know that people can be literally blind because of dissociation, even though their eyes are working just fine. And so is the visual cortex because they don't have any brain activity in the visual cortex, even though their eyes are open. So we know it's true. We know it happens. So I appeal to that empirical reality to substantiate analytic idealism. In the world of science, an appeal to an empirical reality is much strong, stronger than to theoretical entities because there is no discussion. You just point at it and say, look, there it is. It's happening. I don't have to prove that it can happen because it does happen. I'm just extrapolating that. And I'm saying something akin to that happens under other circumstances. So for a scientist, this is the definitive argument. Uh, an, an empirical observation as proof of existence is 
infinitely superior to postulated theoretical entities. But for a philosopher, amazingly enough, it may work the other way around. Goff is not satisfied with my pointing to an empirical reality. He needs to have a conceptual account of it. Otherwise, it's not real to him, which is a kind of neurosis that philosophers uh, have. They think that their conceptual thinking has some kind of ontological privilege over <laughs> empirical reality. No scientist would ever think or feel that way. But in philosophy, it happens, and uh, Philip is not the only one. And, um, and I sometimes I refuse in providing that conceptual account because it's as if I would be acknowledging that the empirical reality is insufficient. And I don't want to acknowledge that because the empirical reality is not only sufficient, it's much superior. It's definitive. It ends the question of whether a process exists in mind that could make one subject have two uh, non-associated experience. It ends that question because we see it happening. It has been objectively measured, not only clinically reported. Um, but in the context of this discussion, okay, I will indulge that. So the disclaimer is the empirical observation is enough. We don't need a conceptual account to substantiate analytic idealism. Dissociation happens in mind space. We know it does. And that's all the analytic idealist needs to say, to, to explain distinct macro subjects um, um, when only one fundamental subject is, is, is postulated. It's through dissociation. The one subject seems to become man many because of dissociation. That's the argument for decomposition. It's an empirical argument. Whatever it is, however it works, we know it happens. It happens to people. We can measure that. We can diagnose that through functional brain imaging. So we know it happens. And the only argument is it, it, it can happen in under different circumstances. And that's what life is. That's the image of what a dissociative process looks like in the brain scanner of the universe, in the brain scan of the universe, it's life. So that's the account. But conceptually, which is what philosophers need in order to grant reality to what is an observation for us, because I'm also, I, I started out as a scientist, I was a scientist before I was a professional philosopher. So for me, it's like incomprehensible that uh, people, some philosophers just don't accept an empirically grounded argument. But to entertain that neurosis, that peculiar character trait, here's how to think about it. We think about it in terms of integrated information theory. Problem is, neither Philip nor probably this other philosopher you were quoting are familiar with in integrated information theory. And then it becomes a difficult discussion because their accusation is you don't have a conceptual account of it. And then I say, I do have a conceptual account of it, but for you to see it, you need to understand IIT, which they don't, and therefore I don't have a conceptual account of it. You see, uh, when you're fighting against this kind of uh, ignorance, not in a pejorative term, but in, in, in the sense of to ignore, to not be aware of, it's difficult, but here it goes. IIT shows us that experience can be modeled through graph theory. Particular phenomenal properties, contents of experience, like a color, a shape, a sound, a memory, a thought, a feeling, an atomic feeling, an atomic thought, and, and something that cannot be decomposed further. Uh, all of these can be represented as vertices in a graph. And the way information circulates through them, bringing them together, can be modeled through edges in graph theory or vertices. <coughs> Information integration theory tells us that um, the graph configuration that you achieve by moving the vertices around, to deciding what's connected, uh, how things are connected, that can be empirically determined through brain imaging. But the vertices will arrange themselves themselves in such a way that um, they will form a subgraph of maximum information integration in which these atomic qualities of experience will be brought together and constitute one unified experience that has many qualities. For instance, let's make it concrete. <clears throat> if you're walking through a museum looking at a painting, that experience is unified. There is a unified experience of yourself. 
as you're walking through the museum looking at paintings. But that unified experience has components. Each painting has different colors. There is the feeling of your feet inside your shoes as you walk and press on the ground. There is a tactile sensation of your clothes rubbing on you as you move. There is the sensation of the inflation of your rib cage as you inhale. There is the sensation of the air flowing out your nostrils when you exhale. The smells that in the air, the sounds of the other people around, all of these qualities come together and are integrated in this unitary experience of you in the museum. Yeah. Under information integration theory, this unitary experience is a maximum complex of information integration. If you were to add to it another quality that is not part of this maximum graph, if by adding this other experience, say a memory, if you were to add that memory, and the result would be that you would reduce the total amount of information integration because you dilute it by adding things, then what will happen is that the addition will not happen. You will always have a unitary experience of maximum information integration. If there is something that you can add to increase the amount of information integration, then that will be added. If by adding it, you reduce the amount of information integration, then what will happen, there will be the formation of what is called technically a fault line in information integration theory. In other words, any new aspect of your experiential state that if you were to add it would dilute the amount of integrated information, that addition will not happen. Attention mechanisms will not allow that to happen because it would dilute the information. So we are always experiencing a complex of maximum information integration. Always, at all times. And that's why experience feels unified at all time. Because everything that is not integrated in it remains dissociated from it. It would reduce the amount of information integration. There, there, there is a, it's difficult to talk about it without a blackboard for me to draw. But the point I'm trying to make is the following. It is entirely natural under information integration theory that we have multiple dissociated experiential complexes at one and the same time. Dissociation is, is the, the sine qua non of existence. Association will happen up to a point of maximum information integration and then it will stop. Because if you were to continue associating and to lead to a dilution of the information integrated in the complex, then that's not how mind works mind goes for maximum information integration. There are excellent theoretical and empirical reasons to think that this is what's happening. Research with patients in, patients in locked in syndrome shows exactly this. Um, that is the mechanism. The, in, in information integration theory, that's called the exclusion principle. One experience is what it is and not anything else. Experiences are unified and discernible from one another. That's the exclusion principle. And it, you get it free on the information integration theory. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt before, but um, it, it, sorry. Okay. Can I interrupt? So, yeah. So, 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 so I'll, I'll complete the, the point then. So under analytic idealism, how do micro subjects arise conceptually speaking, not only empirically, from this one field of subjectivity that is all there is. Okay, now think of mental states as patterns of excitation of this field, and they're happening everywhere because it's a self-excitable field, just like quantum fields are self-excitable, nothing new here. These individual self-excitations will cluster together to maximize information integration. Why? Because that's how mind works. Same thing with quantum field theory. Why are the laws of nature the way they are? Well, because they are the way they are. <laughs> and mind is the way it is. Um, and that's the basic premise of information integration theory, the five postulates uh, that are axioms. They come from observation, not theorizing. So these axioms will make sure that these individual self-excited mental states will cluster together so to maximize information integration. 
when that happens, you have one subject experiencing a unified mental inner life, you and me. The same axioms, including the principle of exclusion, will ensure that if you were to continue to do that, uh, it would lead to a dilution of the information integrated uh, by the complex. And therefore, it will not happen because that's not how mind works. So that makes sure that I will never merge with you, that I will never merge with the environment around me because that would constitute a dilution of information integration. I would be adding more vertices to the graph without enough information flowing through uh, the, 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 the vertices, the, the, um, the edges. This is perfectly well and good. I, I, I follow you totally, but what he will bring up, because we had an email exchange, MI and I were thinking about this together and then we'd email Damien and it's like a choose your own adventure. If, if you say no, well, then this one opens up. And if you say yes, this one. So the question now, because we did think about this one, we said, and Damien wrote us back. He says, it seems to me that whether Castrop's cosmic idealism avoids my argument depends on the details of we we use submergence, but DID, right? It's 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 kind of like a fracturing of, right? Yeah. We're kind of coming down. I know it's terminology, but DID. If this if the submergence is mediated by fundamental laws, then the view avoids the argument, but like Phillips' view, at the cost of not being pure idealism. Um. Now. That, that I, I, that's difficult to say because then we wrote back well why aren't they mental and mi said the exact same thing why why can't they be yeah <laughs> but to me this sounds like a game of words but again i have i didn't engage in the discussion myself so i have a limited view but to be is to have properties um if something is if something exists then it has the properties it has to have no properties to not be only non-existence have no properties so when I say there is only one subject, one field of subjectivity, I'm saying that it is. And therefore, it has properties. It is what it is and not something else. Conceptually, it could be anything, but it is what it is. It, the same applies to the whole of nature in physics. Nature is what it is and not something else. The universal constants are what they are and they're not something else. Therefore, physical properties are what they are and they're not something else. That doesn't mean that I'm requiring anything other than physics same thing here as an idealist i say there is only one subject and because this subject is it has properties it behaves in a certain way determined by what it is instead of other ways determined by what it is not the fact that it is means that it is what it is and therefore does what it does according to its own intrinsic regularities of behavior to be is to have these properties so I'm not adding anything beyond the subject if I say that the subject has properties, that because it is what it is, it behaves in the way it behaves. Same thing for nature. Nature behaves the way it does because it is what it is and not something else that it could be with different fundamental constants. So same thing for mind, which is nature. I'm talking about the same thing with different words. Mind is nature. To say that there is one mind, one subject, is to say that it does what it does because it is what it is as opposed to something else that it is not, right? So that mental states cluster together to maximize information integration and maintain dissociation if clustering would reduce and dilute information integration, that's a pattern of behavior that is intrinsic to the subject. It behaves like this because it is what it is. And it's there's no difference. There's no mediation of non non-mental laws it's all of course not it is look it's the same with the guitar string yep a guitar string has a certain length a certain uh, diameter and a certain elasticity and a certain weight these things determine the harmonics you can play on that guitar string if you pluck it it will vibrate in one of its harmonics that harmonic is determined by what the guitar string is that will determine in which notes it can vibrate, its elasticity, its length, its diameter, and so forth. <clears throat> For it to vibrate in a certain uh, harmonics doesn't require that it be something other than it's not. That behavior, that it plays that note, is implied by what the guitar string is. 
the guitar string has properties, so it has natural frequencies of oscillation. Same thing for mental processes. Mental processes are, are under an analytic idealism, are excitations of the subject. So all you need for these excitations to behave in certain ways and not in others is for, sub for the subject to be what it is as opposed to something else conceivable. <laughs> you see, that's all there is. There is nothing, I mean, sometimes philosophy, philosophers just irritate me. It's, it, they engage in a kind of mental masturbation that is just, my God, I mean, it, it, Philip has one that uh, I, I don't even want to talk to him anymore because it just pisses me off, which he says, oh, Bernardo, when you say that uh, it's a mind that underlies nature, then you're saying that there is something more than just the mind. I'm saying, it's a figure of speech. What I'm saying is that the mind is nature, but because it appears to us as if it were not just a mind because of our human prejudices, then I say that there is a mind underlying nature. I'm not appealing for something else, something extra. It's just an expression. <clears throat> so in this case, I think this person is get caught in word games. Wittgenstein had something to say about this <laughs> in the 1940s, all these word games. If people think that they can they can come up with two different words for the same thing, then they think they are dealing with two different things. It's just silly. It's to project in the ontic structure of reality the structure of language. It, it, it is just silly. There is just one subject, and because this subject is, it has properties. And because it has the properties it has and not other properties, it tends to behave the way it does and not in some other ways. Therefore, sometimes it associates, sometimes it doesn't. And the business of science and philosophy is to figure out what those regularities of behavior are, model them, and then make predictions and see if those predictions hold up to empirical scrutiny. And in the case of integrated information theory, lo and behold, we know since last year, it measures up pretty well to, to empirical scrutiny. It fits pretty well. <clears throat> yeah, because he said if submergence or we say disassociation, whichever we like to say, um, can happen without the mediation of laws. So that would be a problem for me, so for him, and would result in a counterexample to the premise three. But then he says he's skeptical that it could produce a, a human consciousness significantly different from the fun fundamental without the aid of laws. So maybe there's a bias here. But, but why is he talking about without the aid of laws? Everything in nature happens according to some regularity. Um, other than individual quantum measurements, whose underlying regularities we haven't found out yet, which leads some to say um, that they are not there at all because we supreme divine beings that we are. If we couldn't figure out the regularities of individual quantum measurements so far, then they don't exist. I think that's incredibly arrogant. Uh, other than individual quantum measurements, everything in nature unfolds according to identifiable regularities. We have figured it out largely, not all, but largely everything we have studied so far unfolds according to some regularities. Why? Because nature is what it is, and therefore it does what it does consistently. It doesn't stop being what it is from one moment to the other. So if you drop a rock from your hand in moment one and the rock falls down to the floor, in moment two, if you drop that, that rock, it will fall down again because nature didn't become different between moments one and two. It's still the same nature. Therefore, it does the same things. This is a regularity. Everything in nature obeys regularities because nature is still what it is. So mind is the same thing. So, of course, whatever dynamic mental process there is to account for the emergence of macro subjects, in other words, associative and dissociative processes, whatever that is, it's unfolding according to regularities that are determined by what this mind is by what nature is and it is what it is and not something else therefore it does what it does and not something else and it doesn't act completely different from moment one to moment two because it didn't become something other than it was already in moment one when it gets to moment two so the whole question about whether you this is this works according to some law i mean law is outdated terminology in science by the way law is a metaphor the universe is not following a decreed law by a divine entity somewhere uh, what we have is regularities, and we we extrapolate those regularities inferentially uh, forward. Um, but there is not written stone that nature is obeying laws. It's just doing what it does because it is what it is. And since it is what it is, what it does tends to be regular, since it doesn't stop being what it is from one moment to another. So the, the right word is regularities. Law is, is a misleading, outdated terminology, but... Even to raise the question, does this 
does this happen according to laws or not? Of course it happens according to laws. I mean, <laughs> what kind of thinking is that, that something happens in nature that, it, that doesn't follow some regularity determined by what nature is as opposed to what it is not? This kind of thing irritates me in philosophy. It is, I find it exasperating. This kind of, you know, conceptual acrobatics completely detached from reality. But anyway. Okay, because... I mean that 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 would be good. I mean, he, he, we'll send the video to him, and then he can uh, he can see what uh, what the uh, what he thinks. But he does he does posit this after we do talk a bit. He says my argument is only against views that posit that both a physical structure and b macro consciousness reduce to the fundamental consciousness, and that does sound like that does sound like uh, analytic idealism. But if oh, it does. Sorry? Macro subjects reduce to the one right. subject. And physical structure. Physical structure is a representation of the dynamics in that one subject. Mm -hmm. In the subject. Right. So and that's, it, that's what we can, think. The impurity is not, there's no impure idealism here. It's just one ontological it's substance. It's only one thing. It is one thing is not extended because I think extension is, is an artifact of perceptual cognition and space time are the, the scales of the dials in the dashboard. They are not out there. They are not an objective external scaffolding of the world where you put things. Space and time are cognitive extensions. I mean, Kant already said that well, 250 years ago now, <clears throat> 51 even. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but you, to visualize things, we have to use space-time. We can't visualize pure cognitive structure. We know it exists, uh, but it's difficult to visualize because visualize is an appeal to vision. It's an appeal to perception. So we can visualize this one subject as an extended field. It is the fabric of space-time, put it that way. Um, and all the diversity of nature, the diversity of states in nature, arise from particular patterns of excitation of this one field. Uh, think of it as a lake. A lake can ripple in many different ways, depending on the wind, the strength, the direction of the wind. Um, you can have ripples of mo going in multiple directions, heights, width, uh, frequencies, amplitudes. They can interfere constructively and destructively, destructively one an with one another, creating all kinds of interesting patterns. Um, but there is nothing to those ripples but the one lake. You cannot grab one of those ripples and take it home with you under your armpit. Why? Because there is no ripple. The ripple is not a thing. It's a doing. It's a behavior of the lake. A ripple is a dynamic configuration of states of the lake. There is ever only the lake. Ripples are not things. Same thing here. Particular phenomenal states with their particular unique qualities that you can differentiate from one another are different ripples in the lake of the one subject. They are different patterns of excitation of this one thing. And there is nothing to these mental states but the thing that is excited. Just like there is nothing to all this humongous variety of possible ripples other than the lake that ripples. There is only ever the lake. So this diversity of the states of nature can be reduced to just one field of subjectivity, just like all the different ripples and whirlpools can be reduced to the lake. There is ever only the lake. Same thing here. There is, a, there is ever only the one subject. Now, these this excitations of this one subject, they unfold according to some regularities. Of course they do. You can call them laws. It's a bad word, but it's the word many still use. Of course, they unfold according to certain laws. Why? Because this one subject is what it is and not something else. And it, it doesn't stop being what it is from one moment to the other. It's still that one subject, and therefore, its behavior is self-consistent across time. Therefore, regularities. So everything will unfold according to regularities and the properties of the subject, like the uh, we talked about earlier, the length the elasticity, the diameter, and the weight of the guitar string determine the notes it can play. Well, the properties of this one subject, whatever they are, determine the way in which it vibrates, determine the notes that it plays, determines the dynamics of its individual mental states and how they cluster together or not. In other words, 
dissociation and association, they are part of the regularities of behavior of this one subject. And there is nothing but this one subject. Just like there is nothing to any note that you play on the guitar string, but the guitar string in movement, in excitation, changing states. Same thing here. There is only the subject. You reduce everything to the subject. You do not need any extras. You do not need any external imposition um, uh, in order to, to model or, or account for what it does, for all the associations and dissociations. These are just the, the compound outcome of the basic regularities or the basic properties of the subject. Uh, and th these properties need to be there. This subject is what it is and not something else. So it has certain properties and, and not other properties. Mind has intrinsic properties. Jung even called them archetypes, gave them a name, and even tried to catalog what those regularities were, those intrinsic properties, how they modulated the behavior of mind. Same thing here. Uh, uh, what aggravates me in these discussions with philosophers, which I'm doing less and less now, I'm mostly talking to scientists now, <clears throat> is this, <clears throat> these word games. <clears throat> Instead of trying to understand what is meant, or what the interlocutor is trying to communicate, pointing to through words, they keep looking at the finger that points, they keep looking at the word, and they attribute to the thing being discussed the structure of the words used to try to describe the thing being discussed. And, and it leads to all kinds of silly stuff. And I suspect that this is one of these instances. I know Philip is definitely capable of indulging in this kind of thing. And Wittgenstein dedicated half of his life to trying to help people understand that they're just playing bloody language games. Uh, uh, instead of trying to understand what is being pointed to, see what is being pointed to, if you stick to the linguistic structure of the words used, you will you you miss the obvious. I doubt that the vast majority of my non-philosopher readers would have the difficulty <laughs> that you're describing to me now, coming from this other philosopher. It, it, it would be all obvious to them what I'm talking about. Uh, but philosophers invent words, and then they mistake the structure of the language they use for the structure of the thing that is being described, and fall into all kinds of silly pitfalls. Anyway, it's uh, I don't want to accuse uh, what's his name, Jonathan, Damien Alexiev. Damien, I, I don't want to blame Damien for for this frustration. I never talked to him. I don't really know his work, uh, so he shouldn't feel. In insulted uh, by this. this is not motivated uh, by what he said it's triggered by what he said because it makes me remember many other instances in which uh, something like what i just said uh, happened to me and i experienced it as uh, as frustrating as a waste of time as uh, a, a needless obstacle in the road of communication artificially put in there for no reason. And you know, as a philosopher, I have a real problem with the community I'm part of, perhaps because of my origins as a scientist. You know, my brain was wired in a different way early in my life. So I take exception to some of the cost, some of the habits in philosophy. No, and I just want to say something real quick too, Kyle, I don't mean to interrupt, um, but because uh, I've looked over this paper, not as extensively as my co-host here, but um, I've read some of the more relevant sections and I have, my attitude is very much like your own. I was very, like, I'm not trying to be mean or insulting to the, to the author, but I was very much like, I don't see much of a problem here. I think this guy's got a lot of assumptions that he's kind of sneaking in here and he's just like, like this whole metric terminology is just kind of mudding the waters. And I, I, I'm just kind of like, I, I just don't think this... Uh, argument from this gentleman again not to mean i just don't think it's a very good argument i'm not i don't find it too threatening i don't really think about it <laughs> but about my co-host he sees he sees a lot of things that i don't so i trust his judgment and he, he's you no know, he, he seems to he wants to nip it in the bud he wants to make sure that this author isn't sneaking in some objection that'll come bite us in the butt maybe in the future or something so i don't know He's no, just this is good. It, it's good that we do this, and it's good that you this, do this to me. It's helpful to me, but it, it, it gives me a chance to react to it. Because to be honest with you, if I had read 
this paper, I probably wouldn't react to it publicly. Yeah. Because it's just not a productive uh, um, expenditure of time. But since we are talking and we are having a pleasant, dynamic and rich conversation, it gives me an opportunity to, to react to it. But I don't want to single out this person. Um, this is very common in philosophy. Um, some of it is malicious, most of it is not. Uh, philosophers, this is what they do. They don't go into a laboratory and do measurements. Um, all they have is the conceptual card game in their heads, in their minds. That, that, that's all they have. Um, and and they, they, they need to publish a certain number of papers every year. And those papers need to grab some degree of attention. So the papers are cited, so their age index uh, uh, improves. And if they fail in doing that, they have a bad performance appraisal. They don't get a good salary increase. They may even lose their job or their contract may not be renewed. Um, and this is the reality of analytic philosophy today. So a lot of the work that is produced is produced under duress. You have to write about something. So you choose something that is more or less related to your interests. And then you squeeze some water out of that rock, even if there is nothing to say about it. You know, you will voluntarily or not come up with something to say about it out of some language game that will allow you to make a publication and get some citations, especially if you're talking about a subject that, is, that, that has popular recognition that people are talking about as opposed to something highly niche and obscure. So you get this and, and, and I, I understand it. Uh, it's even difficult to blame the people involved for this, their salaries are coming from this. Mine is not. My, my salary never came from this. Um, but I am in a privileged position. Uh, most philosophers, you know, if they want to have another kid and they need to earn more, they have to play the game. And all they have is words, language, concepts. Uh, and they, they have to squeeze water out of that rock because, you know, there are so many publications nowadays. Thousands and thousands and thousands of publications. So, so more and more are expected from you. And you have to sit in your armchair there and read some stuff and come up with some new terms and, and make something out of it. I, I, I don't blame people for this. I, 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 by and large, it's not malicious. By and large, it's sincere, although the motivations are, are, are tricky. But it has nothing to do with looking for the truth. And that's the problem. Philosophy is, is a job now, and, and it's good in the sense that it allows people to dedicate their lives to it, but it's bad because it's a job. It's not a spontaneous, authentic, absolutely honest, sincere search for truth. Um, papers need to be published. Uh, citations need to be collected. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, that's partly why I don't try to tie my income to what I do here. I don't ask for like, you know, money or, or sell things. I, I'm not totally against that, but that's what you just said right there at the end is partly why I, I just, I want this to be about the truth, not about me trying to make money. So yeah. I like that. And, and look, it, it's not malicious. In, uh, people might be th might be thinking, Bernardo said it's not malicious, but his descrip description can only be interpreted as something malicious. No, because... It is this need for publication and for production of something original, unless you're a philosopher that review the work of other philosophers, which is even worse, because usually you misrepresent and misportray the whole thing, like Schopenhauer, poor Schopenhauer, must have turned in his grave a few dozen times by now. Um, because there is this need for publication, this need to submit a paper to a conference, uh, to, to get cited, to publish somewhere, because of your performance appraisers and all that, it creates a culture in which words, new words and word games create non-existing problems and subjects. Once you get caught into that culture and you grow up that way and you're educated that way and everybody around you is playing the same word games, it is no longer malicious. It becomes philosophy as it is practiced. You see? So... It's a philosophy as it originally was done. It was done either by people who were uh, financially independent. Marcus Aurelius, Roman emperor. He didn't earn his living from being 
a philosopher from writing the meditations, right? So the meditations are absolutely honest. It's what the guy really thought. And he was not, his, his thinking was not clouded by inexistent problems created out of language or language, language, ga language games like uh, Wittgenstein uh, described it. Um, others had patrons, Plato and Aristotle. Um, but now they have jobs and salaries. And this is good in a sense, you, you don't need to have a patron and you don't need to have another source of income. So you, you don't need to uh, suck up to anybody and you, and, and you don't need to spend hours of your day doing something else. That's good. But it creates this, this, this environment where to get your salary, you need to produce and that production needs to be objectified. Uh, so it's quantitative and not qualitative. You need to publish many papers. Even if your papers are crap, you need to publish many papers. And you need, need to get lots of citations. Even if the citations are crap, the H index doesn't distinguish. It's, it's quantity. And the moment somebody tries to judge somebody else qualitatively, oh, you get accused of bias, of not being fair, the system is not fair, it's too subjective, the rules of the game are not laid out properly. In other words, it becomes all a sausage-making uh, industry. You know, papers need to be produced, they don't need to be good. So you just produce the sausages and you keep bringing out the sausages, you fill them in, them in with whatever bits are left, whatever... You know, unfortunately, this 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 is the reality, and um, I am uniquely free to say this because I'm not really part uh, uh, of that. I, that um, I, I am I earn my living running a foundation, and I earned my living before helping run a company and founding a company once that got sold. So uh, I am in a privileged position, and I understand it. But I think it's important that people be aware of the nature of of how the game is played today. Uh, I think that's absolutely fair. Uh, um, I don't, Damien really thinks highly of you. He, he's like, it'd be an honor for you guys to discuss this with him. And he, he really took your work seriously. So that's why um, I, I think this is a genuine thing. And I don't know if you'll ever read it, but... Um, yeah, um, I didn't direct all, all my rant. Yeah. It was not directed at him. Okay, uh, It's yeah. just that talking about these things triggered my memories. Mm -hmm. I, I'm ranting against... Uh, professional philosophy in general, yeah. not about Damien. So please, if he's listening to this, Damien, I I'm sorry if I got across like that. I do not know you. I do not know your work. I cannot pass judgment on you. So I, I simply do not know uh, the quality of what you're doing. Okay, so um, before we get to the physics gap, which is the last thing, um, the premise three, so he said that if space-time's experiential ground has metric everywhere, the human experiences also have metric. Um, so if cosmopsychism, so he's going to talk about a um, idealist cosmopsychism, uh, the fundamental reality is one ubiquitous consciousness. Uh, all experiences are grounded in the cosmic consciousness. However, if this is true, the cosmic consciousness would be incredibly complex. Nevertheless, I cannot see how cosmic psychism offers anything new against uh, argument three, which is second, his third premise. Sorry, it's there. Third premise is same metric. If space times experiential ground has metric everywhere, then human experience is a metric everywhere. And then he goes on and says space times experiential ground does not have metric everywhere. And that follows from his second premise and third premise. Remind me, what is the definition of metric? Uh, he's using the, pardon me, he's using the metric from uh, non-Euclidean sense. So space from, what? from a non-Euclidean sense. So it's a, the pseudo metric that we use for um, constraints and uh, it's not constrained in ranges that are just positive quantities. So they could be negative and neutral as well. Um, can, can you give me a, an example of what he calls a metric? Oh boy. Does Sorry. he give a canonical example somewhere in the paper? Yeah, hang on. Space time we're gonna get. It's it's pretty big. Hold on. Uh, but I just can maybe narrow it down a little bit. Uh, general relativity is our current best theory of space time. Uh, it unites space and time into a single geometric manifold, space time. In what follows, I will presume epistemic structural realism about space time, the view that all or some space time structure is real. Uh, uh, thus, given the empirical success of 
in GTR, general theory of relativity. This assumption should be acceptable to idealists, depends, I guess, in what follows for brevity. I will use structural realism in place of epistemic structural realism. So geometry allows for okay. many possible, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Allows for many possible metrics, for many possible ways to understand distance. In ordinary life, so we talked about that Euclidean distance. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I understand yeah, him. So, so he's using metric in the sense it's used in relative, the relativity, yeah. the space-time metric. Correct. Uh, and he's making a case for there being uh, an objective, real um, space-time scaffolding out there in the world. And he's appealing to general relativity and its empirical success as, as a reason to grant that. In other words, there is really an extended fabric of space-time out there with uh, um, internal geometric relationships that we can call a metric. Yeah, because that might just differentiate you entirely from this. Um, I think he does, yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yep. I, I, I will grant for the sake of argument to his argument as much as I can. But before I do that, just a quick disclaimer. There are very good reasons to think um, that um, space-time, as we understand it today, will be reduced. Because if we can't do that, we can't reconcile general rel relativity with quantum field theory. And we know that both work in their respective domains, so they are reconcilable. The domains overlap. Um, and therefore, the attempts now being done along the lines of loop quantum gravity uh, will reduce space-time further and uh, and it will get to basically abstraction and not an extended real fabric that provides a sort of scaffolding for existence out there um, but i will ignore this for now uh, uh, i'll grant i'll pretend that um, the fabric of space-time with its in intrinsic metrics really exists objectively and i'll go along um, that line so, under analytic idealism, this field of subjectivity would be this fabric of space-time. The best way to visualize the field of subjectivity would be as empty space. Um, and excitations of this field of subjectivity as being elementary subatomic par particles, as far as we can represent them in perception. So this is one possible way to visualize this one subject of analytic idealism. It, it's not entirely accurate, but bear with me. This is not completely rigorous, but you can try to visualize it as empty space. The subject appears to perception as empty space. Its excitations are the quantum fluctuations and subatomic particles and everything that then comes and fills in the empty space. And we know from physics, and now not relativity, relativity, but field quantum theory, that um, empty space is not really empty. Um, particles pop in and out of existence all the time. Um, why? Well, because empty space ripples. That's the coherent way to understand the quantum foam, is to understand, to understand it as excitations of the underlying field. And the field can only be detected when it's excited. When it's not excited, it's not detected. In other words, it's empty space. But it self-excites all the time, and that's the quantum foam. And sometimes those self-excitations cohere and aggregate and form stable subatomic particles, you and me, stars, galaxies, moons, volcanoes, tornadoes, and so on and so forth. So all of these discernible entities in the physical world under analytic idealism would be excitations of empty space. And by the way, it's the same interpretation under quantum field theory. Uh, you can see all of it as sort of excitations of the, the field that constitutes, the fields that con constitute empty space. So would the subject need to be incredibly complex in that case, because that seems to be the, ch the charge? No. And, and to understand this, you need to understand the basics of uh, complexity theory. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, you, you know about cellular automata? Um, in cellular automata, there is a game called Life. Um, 
Conway's Game of Life is a name. It was invented in the 70s by a mathematician called Conway. And it's based on two extremely simple rules. You have a grid of cells, and the cells can be alive or dead, black or white. And the rules are the following. If three or two neighboring cells are alive, then the cell remains or becomes alive. Otherwise, the cell dies or stays dead. And the idea is to model life because you cannot survive without others around you. So you need two or three to be alive, otherwise you die. But if you're too crowded, then you compete for, the re for resources, which are limited. So you die too. So if you have more than two or three neighbors, you die or still stay dead. Less, you die or stay dead. But two or three, you, you live or stay, you stay alive. And if you run this in a computer simulation, only these two extremely simple rules, the dynamics that evolve is incredibly complex. That's why it's called the game of life, because it looks like there are living beings being formed and reproducing, cannons form, firing projectiles that kill other things, geometric figures of amazing complexity evolve. And, and this is not the best example. There are other fractal-based cellular automata that are much more impressive and with even simpler rules. So what we consider to be complex in nature is the compound outcome, the iterative self-referential application of simple rules. In other words, the subject may be extremely simple, unintelligent, Probably is not, but it may be. It's consistent with analytic idealism that the subject have only very simple rules, like a cellular automaton, like the game of life. And by recursively applying these rules repeatedly, what seems to be amazing complexity arises. But we know better now than to mistake complex manifestation for intrinsic complexity, because we have now so many examples that disprove this, this association. You can have extraordinarily complex manifestations out of extraordinarily simple rules. Fractals, cellular automata, extremely simple rules, extraordinarily complex manifestations. Um, look at the work of uh, Stephen Wolfram, um, for instance, which I don't take to be physics, although he fancies it as physics. I don't think it is, but I think it's very illustrative anyway. Um, so to say that this amazing variety of states that constitute nature. All the galaxies, quasars, uh, pulsars, black holes, moons and planets and stars and living beings and volcanoes and trees and all that. To say that all that is grounded in one subject does not entail or imply that the subject needs to be intrinsically complex. For the same reason, that when you look at the game of life, it looks complex, but the underlying thing is not. It's extremely simple. So that's one way to answer the question, by granting what we know is not true, which is that the fabric of space-time is objectively real as opposed to a theoretical entity. We know better than that now. Um, that's the leading edge of physics for the past 20 years or so. But uh, I would not blame him for maybe not being aware of that. It's impossible to be aware of everything that is happening in every field of relevance. I, in this case, I, I happen to know because I, I have a relationship with physics that comes from very early in my life. My first job was at CERN. I have been around physics for a long time. Now, in reality, I don't think the subject is a field. I don't think the subject, subject is extended at all. Because extension is a cognitive artifact. We impose extension on the world in order to organize data about the world. It's the way we file data about the world. It's our file system. Space and time is our file system. It's the rows and, and columns of cabinets that we use to file information about the world to prevent cognitive overload. In other words, I am with Kant and Schopenhauer and many physicists, like the physicists doing physics of first-person perspective, I am with them in stating that space-time is in here, not out there. So how would then this explanation work in that case? We have to withdraw extension from the real world and imagine extension as being just a cognitive state, but we cannot withdraw structure from the world. 
because if perception is a representation of the world, an extended representation in space-time, and perception has structure, then there has to be structure in the world. Right? But you have to have that structure without what Schopenhauer called the principium individuationis, without extension. How can there be structure without extension? If things are not extended in space and in time, then everything piles up together, collapses together in a singularity. And a singularity cannot have structure, or can it? A singularity cannot have perceptual structure, but a singularity can have cognitive structure. Um, it can have a structure of meaning associations. The law of similarity being the simplest one. Um, you can have 10 different thoughts and cluster them in three different classes. Two with three thoughts and a fourth and a third with four thoughts. And you have your 10 thoughts clustered together through association. For instance, you can have a thought about your father and a thought about your mother. Well, you cluster them together. Parents is the similarity. You can have a thought about your childhood girlfriend and your first kiss. And you can have a thought about your divorce. Oh, you cluster them together. Partner. You can have a thought about the sun shining. And you can, ha can have a thought about a candle lit in the middle of the night. Oh, you cluster them together. Light. Um, so you can cluster cognitive content contents together through similarity. Sometimes the similarities are extended, like the image of the sun extended in space. Sometimes the similarities are purely meaning-based, like um, mother and father are both parents. Parents can have an extended embodiment, but the concept of parenthood is itself not extended. Um, the meaning of a mathematical equation is not extended. The embodiment of it may be extended. The meaning of the mathematical equation is not. Take Euler's equation, the most beautiful equation. It, it, it's so beautiful, it's impossible. First time I truly understood it, I cried. Um, it's extremely simple. The meaning of that equation does not depend on space-time extension. It's an association between three very useful constants, pi, e, uh, and, and, and i. Uh, and it's amazing how they are associated together, how their meanings come together. Pi has to do with a circle, e has to do with natural logarithms, uh, uh, i has to do with imaginary numbers. You'd think they're completely unrelated. In fact, their origin is completely unrelated. They were in, they were, they, people came up with them for totally different reasons. And that they come together in such a clean way tells you something, if there is a meaning to that. And that meaning does not require extension to exist. You can embody pi in a circle, that's extended, but the meaning itself does not depend on a particular embodiment. It's a cognitive reality. And Euler's equation gives you cognitive structure that is not necessarily extended. So for the idealist, the world out there is not extended, but it has cognitive structure it has particular associations of meaning, semantic associations. And the structure that is embodied through extension on the screen of perception is a representation of that cognitive structure. We cannot absorb the cognitive structure as it is. That would be lead to cognitive overload. Uh, so we represent it. We put it in, in neat rows of drawers, rows and columns of drawers on the screen of perception. And we call that space-time. So in reality, for the idealist, what is really out there is not extended. It's not the space-time metric. It's not the fabric of space-time. What is out there does not have extended metrics, does not have length, does not have duration, does not have angles or any kinds of geometrical relationships. But it does have structure. It has cognitive structure, semantic associations that are built into it. That's what's really out there. And these semantic associations can be visualized through extension as patterns of excitation of the very fabric of space-time. But in and of themselves, they are not the fabric of space-time. They are semantic associations with cognitive structure, not extended structure. That, that, now I gave you the whole story of analytic idealism. I was going to say, this might just have refuted the whole rest of the argument, but I mean, you'll have to see, but okay. <laughs> 
the last the last part of this is the physics gap and you already touched a lot of it but am i did you want to read it just in case and then bernardo can say yes or no or sure <laughs> then... yeah exactly so yeah this this will be pretty quick so he says there's this physics gap it's an explanatory gap between the fundamental experiences and and structure and so this is the problem of explaining how the fundamental experiences ground structure and he tries to say this is such an overused term, but they try to say it's the mirror image of the hard problem of consciousness, that it's the hard problem in reverse. And so, uh, yeah, so I guess the question could be, how how does idealism ground experience with the structure of space okay. time and all that? So the hard problem is the problem of our not being able to deduce in principle the qualities the qualities of experience from physical parameters that we cannot make this in principle deduction is the hard problem. So to say that we have something equivalent to the hard problem here would require our being unable to deduce um, the parameters of the physical world in principle from the cognitive dynamics of the one subject. I submit to you that there is no such problem uh, that deduction can be made directly because you don't have an ontic gap to bridge. Um, in the hard problem of consciousness, you have the ontic gap from things that are exhaustively described through quantities to things that are intrinsically qualitative. You have two different essences, two different types of stuff, the quantitative one and the qualitative one, and you, you cannot bridge the gap. In the case of analytic idealism, you have qualitative stuff on both sides. The cognitive structure in the one subject is mental. Cognitive structure, semantic associations, mental stuff. And the structure of the screen of perception is mental. It's the stuff we see, the stuff we hear, the stuff we taste. All of these are mental states the qualities of the colors we see, the qualities of the flavors we taste, the qualities of the textures we feel with our hands, the melody of the sounds we hear. These are all mental states, qualitative states. You can describe them through quantities, but in essence, they are mental states. So you have mental states on both sides, endogenous cognitive structure on the one side, and on the representation side, you have the qualities of perceptual experience. Quality to qualities. There is no ontic gra uh, gap uh, that needs to be magically bridged. All you need is an isomorphic, or not an isomorphic, sorry, a hopefully bijective function that allows you to infer one from the other. And look, you get that automatically by understanding that the way perception works is by representing what's out there. In other words, perception allows itself to be modulated by the dynamics of the states out there. That's how we gather information about the external world. We let the external world modulate some of our states, like the states of our retinas, of our eardrums, the surface of our, of our skin. They are modulated by the photons, the air pressure waves, and so forth that are out there. Um, so you get this transfer function immediately. The qualities of perception are related to the endogenous, non-extended uh, uh, cognitive structure of mind at large because the latter modulates the former. After all, this is what perception does. Perception is the process by which we allow the external cognitive states of the world to modulate some of our inner states so we can perceive the world. Now, there is a, it's a transfer function, so there is a change in that. We don't see the world as it is. Um, in itself, because one, it's not conducive to survival and um, for evolutionary evolutionary reasons, and also because of thermodynamic reasons. There is no a priori upper bound to the entropy of the world. So if our internal cognitive states would mirror the states of the world, there would be no a priori upper bound to our internal entropy, uh, which is not compatible with life. Uh, we could die just by looking at the world. Clearly, that, not, that does not happen. So our perceptual internal cognitive states are representations of the external, non-extended cognitive structure of mind at large, representations that aim to convey, convey salient information about the world in an actionable manner, but also in a manner, manner that puts an upper bound to the, maximum, to, the, to, to, to the entropy of our cognitive states. But one is modulated by the other, 
and they are both of the same ontic kind. They are both experiential, mental, cognitive, phenomenal. Um, so there's just no hard problem at all, I'm afraid. No, not at all. And the burden is not on me to show that there is no hard problem. Um, it, to claim that um, somebody is incurring in a problem equivalent to the hard problem demands that the person explains why there cannot be an in principle deduction from the qualities of one, to, to, from the properties of one to the properties of the other. Um, in the case of mental to mental modulation, this is obviously not the case. Look, some of our experiences modulate some of our different experiences every day. Your thoughts modulate your emotions. If you have a negative thought, you, you tend to have a, a, a bad emotion that feels bad. A pessimistic thought and a bad emotion, one modulates the other. Or if you're having optimistic uh, 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 thoughts, uh, you, you may feel elated. You may have more positive emotions. So thoughts modulate emotions and emotions modulate thoughts every day. They are both mental and yet they are qualitatively different qualitatively different. What I'm saying is exactly the same. There are qualitative states out there in the world. They modulate our inner qualitative states. And that's what we call perception. The result of that modulation are the qualities on the screen of perception that capture information about the external cognitive structure of the world, non-extended, because it's modulated by that cognitive structure. There is no hard problem here at all. Yeah, thank you for that. I've just I'm kind of that. Um, I know we're getting towards the end here. I'll just make this quick comment here. It's just I, I, when I'm debating non-idealists, there are so many of them want to go. It is you, idealist, that has the real hard problem. And I'm like, okay, big guy, all right. And, and they always have a different. <laughs> they always make up a new version. They always have a different. I'm like, oh, is that the hard problem for idealism? I thought it was this before. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, it's just it's just funny. But uh, go ahead, Kyle just want to wrap up the argument and then I guess we'll bid adieu. Uh, we'll say buy off camera, I guess for 30 seconds or something. Um, okay. Okay, cool. So I guess this one is just, this will be the follow-up and it'll say, and this is where the kind of Mysterian aspect comes in. It says, can we know what phenomenal properties are or is there just a cognitive gap? And I guess an analogy I got from uh, uh, Yuji Nagazawa is that you can have the ingredients and then dinner, but you don't know how dinner's made. There's just a gap. But I feel like just us being humans, it's we're gonna have that gap eventually at some point, somewhere, right? Well, we are acquainted with phenomenal properties. That's all we are acquainted with. So there is a sense in which we know them all by the mere fact that we experience them. But cosmophenomenal. Oh, yeah, 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 I understand that. So w w what he's hinting at is we cannot know what it is like to be the inanimate universe, even though we have a representation of it in the form of perception. And that is true. That is true. Um, our access to the inner phenomenal states of mind at large is always intermediated by the screen of perception. Um, for very good reasons, thermodynamic and game theory, game theoretical reasons. Um, but it prevents us from having, in principle, direct access to what it is like to be mind at large. Having said that, we the reason we don't have that direct access is because we are dissociated from it. Somehow, the complexities and the information integration dynamics works in such a way that we are we are dissociated from it. That's what life is. However, we know that there are certain things that impair our cognitive processes. And it stands to reason to think that even the dissociative process itself, the process that enforces the dissociation, that too can be impaired. It looks like some patterns of brain activity, we don't know exactly which ones, but if you impair the brain as a whole, you end up impairing those too. In other words, the dissociation will be rendered more porous and it stands to reason that some of what you experience in that case is not only the skeletons in your own closet, but some stuff that is not yours, some stuff that is beyond your outer, beyond your dissociative process. Mystics seem to be reporting that for a long time. So it is conceivable because no process in nature is perfect. It is conceivable that neither is the dissociation we call life. I mean, when something burns, 
it never burns everything that is combustible. Always something is left behind. Um, when it stops raining, the ground doesn't dry up completely and immediately. No process in nature is bulletproof and perfect. Neither is dissociation. So I wouldn't be surprised even if even spontaneously, now and then, some stuff could come to us that is not ours, that belongs in the cognitive neighborhood that most of the times is kept dissociated from us. But now and then there is some traffic because no process in nature is perfect. Why would a dissociation be? If we could have a research program that um, leverages this possibility in a systematic way, we could make the inference. And, and I will tell you how I think is the most promising way to do that. I, and and I, I've been thinking about it a lot for the past year. And it's, it's going to be the focus of what I do going forward. Um, if you take IIT, Integrated Information Theory, and make it metaphysically neutral, what do they do? What are they trying to do? They are trying to find a mapping between measurable, measurable brain states and a, a model of experiential states. Which is done via graph theory, but what that graph is modeling are poly states. That's, that's what is being modeled. And they build this transfer function between the two. They try to calibrate this transfer function between the two by knowing both sides. So they know our inner states through introspection, which can be reported. And they know our patterns of brain activity, which can be measured. And you collect as much information as you can from both sides until we can construct a function that links the two through training of a neuronal network, whatever, or, or some information theory, which is what actually happens. After you've done that, if you've done it well, you can begin to extrapolate. In other words, during the training, you, you, you know both sides. But if you did the training well, we have this transfer function. Now, if one of the sides you don't have anymore, you have only one, the measurable physical universe, you can apply the same function to infer the qualities behind it. In other words, you can have, for the first time in human history, a theory of the noumena, not a theory of the phenomena in Kantian terminology. Physics is a theory of phenomena. It's a theory of what we perceive. Even when we use a telescope or a microscope, you still need to perceive the output of instrumentation. Physics is a theory of phenomena. But with IIT, through this calibration that you do, through first introspectively accessing a human being's own inner mental state, and then extrapolating that, once you find the function that relates the two, extrapolating that to the inner states of the universe at large, that would be the first theory of the noumena, uh, we don't have any of that. I think IIT could be that. Um, I think IIT has an importance and uh, significance that maybe not even Julia himself uh, really could apprehend when he proposed it, um, and which is what happens with good theories. Good theories go much beyond their originators. Um, and I think we could do that with IIT. And if we can, then I would say no to the question asked. Yes, we can infer the intrinsic endogenous mental states of the universe at large through this transfer function. We will not know them by direct acquaintance, but we can infer them in a systematic, fairly scientific way at some point in the future. Perfect. I just want to do Damien justice and just read his last little bit because I think we summarized it all. Uh, so he said, any available solution to the combination decombination problem will involve closing the macro experience gap, which was, however, that but he says, however, that will involve positing a ground that does not have metric everywhere. This is, yeah, he said, consequentially, the idea opens up the space time gap, solving the missing entities problem, makes the combination problem harder to solve. Idealists can straightforwardly account for space-time by positing a structurally isomorphic fundamental consciousness. This closes the space-time gap. However, our opens up the macro experience and decombination problem. But you did that. So, and then he says missing entities, but quantum field space-time quantum wave. You also touched on that too. So, uh, I mean, you're the guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> 
Wittgenstein oh. comes to my mind a lot. Wow, these word games that prevent clear vision. Anyway. Nice. Well, Kyle, right, is there anything guys. else? Uh, yeah, I think we're just about done here. Is there anything no, else you want to say? Like, okay. Th th thanks again, Bernardo. As always, it's a real uh, pleasure, a real privilege. And thank you, Kyle, as well. I think both of you, let me tell you, take a little bit of time to, to tell you why I'm so grateful to you. Um, I cannot respond to everybody who writes a paper or produces a YouTube video critiquing analytic idealism. It's just too many people and, and, and a lot of it um, are some simple misunderstandings um, that you guys are out there looking out for these things and then filtering them and then presenting to me what you already filtered. So it gives me a chance to respond to what is more significant as opposed to being overwhelmed with the sheer volume of this stuff. I, I, it's very valuable uh, to me. Uh, otherwise, I could be accused of not responding to any of it because I don't know what to respond to. Um, I still have to do my work. You know, I still want to produce some more philosophy, philosophy of neuroscience now. Um, I can't dedicate my life to scrutinizing the, the critiques um, that people are making. And over the past couple of years, there are so, there's so many more people writing about analytic idealism positively or negatively it seems to be gathering so much more attention now that it it uh, the reaction it provoked in me at first was oh i'm happy with it you know uh, my message is getting across but very quickly after that my reaction was uh, i i don't want to see it i don't want to see it. it it's just too much it it's <laughs> cognitive uh, uh, overload um and and sometimes i it's so simple to give an answer um but if you give that answer, now you have to answer everything else that comes after that, because now you open the precedent of, of, of having given an answer. So the fact that you guys are making this objective, so I don't have to judge it myself. You are judging what's relevant, what is worthy of discussion. I don't play a role in that. And I'm still given the opportunity to answer without cognitive overload. I, I appreciate this very much. So I hope as many people as possible watch these videos uh, you guys are making. Uh, I think these are great conversations we're having. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome, as yeah. always. Always appreciate that. Okay, well, hey, have a good night, everybody. Thanks for joining. Thanks. I'll have dinner now. Take care, guys.